So hello everyone, uh, welcome to the Frontier Dialogue. So this is a time time we've done in a series at Aloha Academy. And we are also celebrating the fourth anniversary of the Academy in June. So uh, before we start officially, I have a few housekeeping notes. So first, please put your phone name and affiliation as the name tag in the Zoom. And as we have a full house tonight, we encourage you to utilize the Zoom chat box to document your question during the speaker's presentations and please mute yourself. In the final 30 minutes discussion session, please raise your hands first and wait for the moderator to call your name before you speak. And as usual, we also have Chinese translator with us today. So please feel free to use the interpretation function at the bottom of the Zoom window. And without further ado, it's my honor to introduce our moderator, Professor Francis Wesley from the University of Waterloo. Professor Wesley, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. And could I remind everybody to mute their uh, speakers when they're not on, because I hear uh, quite a lot of background noise. But uh, so welcome to this first session on diversity for sustainable organizations. And uh, there are three, three, three sessions in this particular um, event. Um, the first one uh, will take 40 minutes and will include um, three, two talks and a discussant. The first speaker is Dr. Simon Levine, who is university professor in ecology and evolutionary biology at Princeton University, and also a distinguished fellow at Luhan Academy. He will be speaking on the relationship between diversity and resilient organizations. So welcome, Dr. Levine. So it's a pleasure to be here today, and thanks to the Luhan Academy for uh, hosting this. Um, and I also want to thank um, my various uh, sponsors who have helped me in, in this work. So it's a natural question to ask what leads to the robustness and resilience in complex systems, particularly complex adaptive systems made up of individual agents, this topic I discussed in, in a, a book 20 years ago. Uh, Long-lived systems, whether in nature or society, share a lot of common principles that, uh, uh, that allow them to, to survive. Um, uh, but at the core, and it's going to be the, the focus of what I'm going to talk about today, is the ability to adapt to changing conditions. Um, and there are multiple ways to achieve robustness or resilience in complex adaptive systems. One can be uh, like a coral in, 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 existing in a turbulent flow uh, with rigid design and robust components. But in the same sorts of flow, one also can be a bull kelp. Uh, adaptive, going with the flow. It's not that one of these strategies is better than the other, but the rigid design may work best over short time scales or in relatively constant environments. But if you're in rapidly changing environments, then flexible design is going to work best over longer these longer time scales. Um, and um, in other words, in changing environments, one has to just, like the Red Queen, keep running just to uh, uh, just to stay in place. Uh, you have to generate diversity. So you have something to select on. And that, of course, is the focus of this whole session today. So diversity is not the only key feature of robustness. Uh, indeed, diversity does provide adaptive capacity. And it's what I'm going to focus on today. Um, and my, one of my favorite examples from evolution is um, the influenza virus. Um, which achieves robustness at the macroscopic level. Influenza has been with us for millennia, um, or even at the subtype um, level, but it does so by um, getting rid of individual strains. Um, you're familiar with H1N1, H5N1, H3N2, et cetera. That refers to the surface proteins, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase, uh, which change rapidly, uh, at least by mutation. And uh, over longer time scales by a process called reassortment. It's essentially recombination. So this rapid change in which strains come and go is what confers robustness uh, at the higher level. Uh, it, it's the generation of diversity, uh, strain diversity and selection on them that allows this process to proceed. Uh, and so individual strains replace um, one another uh, and diversity is crucial, therefore. Another example of, of diversity is the work of Ari Goldberger and his colleagues, particularly my colleague, uh, 
Tim Butman. Um, here you see two uh, heart rate time series. Um, the one at the bottom, a rather regular periodic uh, pattern. The one at the top, a more chaotic pattern. And you might think that the person at the top should be rushed to the hospital, but that's backwards. It's the person at the bottom who's in trouble. The diversity in heart rhythms that's embedded in the chaotic time series is what provides adaptive capacity. And that's a much healthier heart rhythm uh, at the top. Now, before I get back to talking more about diversity, I wanna mention that when one thinks of structural determinants of robustness, diversity is just one of those. Um, redundancy and degeneracy, which means having multiple elements that perform the same function uh, is also important. You've um, probably all heard about the, um, the, the baby formula crisis in the US right now and, and probably elsewhere, where one of the major companies producing baby formula had some problems and that's created a, a shortage. So redundancy is also important. And of course, the, in some way, the more redundancy you have, the less diversity because redundancy means multiple copies of the same thing. And the other structural feature that's important is modularity or compartmentalization. Um, we saw this as a problem uh, in the financial crisis in 2008, where the greater interconnectedness of the system reduced uh, the ability to, um, to limit disturbances and that led to the collapse of the system. But I wanna get back and talk primarily about diversity um, and talk about what evolutionary perspectives can tell us. This is work that Martin Reeves and I, together with Martin's group at the Boston Consulting Group have been working on for a while evolutionary perspectives have a lot to tell us about how um, corporations survive and, um, and um, economic systems more generally. It all goes back to Fisher's fundamental theorem of natural selection, which every population geneticist knows about. And basically what Fisher, without giving you any equations here, what Fisher's theorem tells us is that the rate of evolutionary progress is proportional to the product of two things. One, the strength of selection, if if, they're, um, if, if, if selective differences are not important, then you're not gonna have evolutionary change, but you can't have that change without having uh, some form of genetic diversity. So the degree of diversity in the system is what allows evolution to proceed. Therefore we have selection for um, mutation rates and also even for sexual reproduction as ways to get recombination and change, generating the diversity that natural selection can operate on. Uh, in businesses and, um, and other systems, um, success depends on balancing the current and the new, the balancing exploration and exploitation, balancing selection from within the, what is currently available and mutation that will allow exploration of new alternatives. Environments change after all, and because environments change, uh, and one has to be able to adapt. Competition, competition forces adaptation. Indeed, that competition may be what's causing environments to change. Uh, and th that leads to uncertainty about the future. And in evolution, that selects for bed hedging and exploration. Um, and um, the same thing is true in any organization. One has to not be satisfied with one has, one has to constantly be uh, exploring new alternatives. Uh, it's important to recognize that the degree to which one discounts the future uh, will uh, alter the balance between exploration and exploitation. If you don't care much about the future, then exploration is not important. But if you do care about your children, your grandchildren, um, you're going to begin, or, or the rest of your life, you're going to um, um, do more explore, um, exploration. Um, now, what's happened in, in the business sector is that the increasing growth of industries and especially increasing globalization have led to, um, to a more myopic view, to an increasing connectedness to an increasing systemic risk and to increasing competition. And all of those have led to driving discount rates up. 
paying less attention to the future. And as a result of that, that has driven exploration down and companies are dying younger. Um, and um, this, this is reported in that paper I showed you before, together with Martin, He'll, he will probably say something more about that in a bit. The, the trade-off between exploration and exploitation, which is something we're familiar with in behavioral ecology, is not new to business theory. James March, one of the giants of, um, uh, of organizational theory, uh, wrote this paper um, more than 30 years ago on how organizations learn and the role of exploration and balancing off with exploitation. Ecosystems in the biosphere are, as I said at the beginning, complex adaptive systems. That means they're made up of their heterogeneous collections of individual agents that are interacting locally. The whole system evolves based on the outcomes of those interactions. But not only um, ecological systems, but the socioeconomic systems with which they are interlinked uh, and organizations, including universities and businesses, um, companies. These two are complex adaptive systems. These two are made up of individual agents, uh, those individual agents pursuing their own selfish agendas. Uh, but ultimately, uh, there are um, collective goods um, that have to be sustained. And a, a critical question is how one achieves uh, the cooperation that's needed to protect the collective good. What can we do to prevent uh, collapses? Not what this gentleman is doing here. Um, and indeed, one should understand that critical transitions don't always mean going from the good to the bad. It may mean we're stuck in a bad situation and we'd like to, um, to get out of it. We'd like to get out of the pandemic we're, we're in now. So how do we know if we're um, approaching a critical transition? Are there early warning indicators of uh, collapse? Um, can we read the tea leaves? So Martin Schaeffer has been one of the leaders in looking at dynamic uh, indicators um, like critical slowing down uh, and as, as it, that are anticipatory of change. But I gave you some indicators before, uh, including modularity, redundancy, but especially diversity. If we, um, when we recognize, for example, um, in, in an ecological situation that we're losing biological diversity, we recognize that that is threatening the survival of the system as a whole. So um, diversity itself and the loss of diversity as, lo as well as the loss of redundancy and modularity is an early warning indicator um, that we may be heading for trouble. So to conclude, unpredictability is the most predictable future of future environments. It has driven uh, evolutionary change and it ought to be dri driving the way we respond to protect potential threats like pandemics, uh, et cetera. We know that these are gonna come. Um, the, our, the, the vertebrate immune system has developed because uh, ev evolution has taught that uh, we're going to be um, threatened with a variety of pathogens. We just don't know what they're gonna be and um, when they're gonna come. So because of that unpredictability, we have to have an adaptive capacity. Organizations have to be adaptive just as biological, economic, and other human systems. Uh, and just as the uh, uh, influenza virus has learned to, to adapt to the environment. So um, diversity basically encodes the adaptive capacity of the system in multiple contexts, especially for organizations. And that sets the stage for what we're going to uh, hear from Scott Page and others and, and Martin Reeves. And with that, I will um, end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. That, that's a fantastic beginning to this, uh, this really rich discussion. Oh, our next speaker is uh, Scott Page. He's a university professor of complexity, social science and management at University of Michigan. And he's going to be speaking about how the power of diversity creates better groups, firms and schools. So welcome, Scott. Thanks. It's uh, it's great to be here. Hopefully, this is going to pop up uh, just fine. So, what I want to do um, is play off what Simon talked about. So, Simon talked about the role that diversity plays in terms of creating variation, and then selection allows you to choose the best one to lead to sort of you know, robustness and resilience of systems. 
I want to give a slightly different spin, and I want to talk about how diverse collections, diverse ensembles, are actually what we need to solve really complex problems. And so what I'm going to do is I want to sort of link the idea of diversity to the concept of a collective intelligence, which somehow supersedes or even has sort of possibilities that the individuals that comprise the collective do not have within themselves. So here's sort of the core takeaway, and that is that cognitive diversity improves performance on complex tasks. So the best teams are gonna be cognitively diverse. So very quickly, I just wanna talk about what I mean by complexity, what I mean by diversity and give two logics, one for prediction, one from problem solving. Do a brief detour into sort of how you think about sort of cognitive diversity and identity diversity, and then talk a little bit, you know, within these organizations now, they're incredibly diverse, both disciplinarily, identity, culturally, all sorts of things. And so leadership has to take different forms. So it's not just a matter of having diverse people in the room, it has to do with managing and leading them in the right way. So to step back for just a second, I think, you know, Simon, I think did such a nice job of thinking about how complex systems are and we used to have this sort of platonic idea that we could carve nature to its joints. And so we, one set of people could look at this, there'd be biologists, physicists, chemists, psychologists. We just break up the world into component you know, disciplines and solve things. We now know that the world is much more complex and we can't do that. Now, what do I mean by complexity? There's two notions of complexity. And I talk about these in my book, Diversity and Complexity. One is bore, which is between ordered and random. And this is sort of a statistical view of things. So if I look at something like copper prices, which is the red line, that's neither ordered nor random. But if I look at copper production, which is the blue line, that's actually you know, a nice sort of simple growth curve. So when you look across economic data, biological data, you know, any sort of data, ecological data, you'll see some things that are complex and some things that are not. Complex time series have, they're not random, but they're also not ordered. They're sort of in this in-between space. Another way to think of complexity, though, is what I call deep. It's something that would be difficult to evolve, engineer, explain, or predict, right? So the I is considered complex, so it's very difficult to think about how that evolved. Now, when we think about what the modern world is like, especially, you know, I moved into a management school a couple of years ago because I just found the question so fascinating. It used to be businesses just thought about maximizing profits, right? But now we have 17, actually 16 sustainable development goals, one of which is to coordinate, 17 is to coordinate on those 16. If you look even within any discipline, so this is a field called health technology assessment, it used to be that what they would do is they look at something called qualities, which are quality of life years, and then divide that by cost and say whether this particular health technology, whether it's a drug, a protocol, a surgical technique was worthwhile. Now, as you can see, they've got this whole sort of value flower where there's scientific you know, contributions, there's equity, there's the value of hope, there's spillovers to family. So we live in this world now where we're doing sort of multi-dimensional optimization, multi-criterion optimization, which is just much more complex. If you look at any one problem, so here's a map on obesity and you can see all these different disciplines from media, from social to psychological, and all these arrows are studies showing relationships between these different types of fields. So what this tells us is we can't carve nature at its joints, that we need to have interstitial tissue, we need to have overlap in what we study if we want to really make any progress on these complex problems. Now, what's the evidence? I mean, there's a ton of evidence on this, but I just want to show one recent paper by Dash and Wang. Uh, what you're seeing is you're going to move to the right is two authors, three authors, four authors, five of authors. The top line is paper citations, second is patent to paper citations, the bottom row is patent to patent citations. And what you're on the on each of these graphs, as you move from left to right, you're getting more diversity in the team. Now, as you move up in the lines, this is citations over two years, five years, and 10 years. So what you see from diverse teams is that diverse teams get a lot more citations, but it actually takes a while for that to materialize. So it typically takes five to 10 years. And that's because they're kind of doing deeper, more innovative stuff. Now, there's a bunch of different lenses you can put on this, number of citations, high impact papers, all sorts of things. It's the same story over and over and over again. The very best research comes from diverse teams. I should also add, so does the worst. And that's where management comes into play. So why? So why don't I just very quickly sort of just walk through two logics as to why. So let's first look at prediction. There's a very simple result you can write down called diversity prediction theorem. So if we're predicting something, the crowd's error equals the average error minus the diversity. 
Now, I don't want to think of this as variance. I want to think of this as actually diverse predictions. What, where does the diversity come in? It could come in in representations. It could come in in information. It could come in in like the models people are using, or it could come in how we kind of combine the different ways of doing things. But there's all sorts of ways diversity can sort of enter in and how people or scientists look at problems. How big is that diversity bonus? It's always there. Well, if you look at economic forecasts, the crowd, this is 20,000 forecasts by professional economists over 40 years. The crowd of like you know, 30, 40 economists is 20% better than an average economist. Here's a, another way to look at this graph, that benchmark in an era of one, an average economist. The best economist in this whole population was 10% better than an average economist. But if you choose any four random economists, you're actually 14% better than an average economist. So any four random economists are better than the best economist at predicting. And that's because predicting is complex and in, in sort of both definitions of complexity. So the idea here, and this is where I think we've got to kind of hold two ideas in our head. We think of having a diverse portfolio from a risk mitigation standpoint, right? One stock goes up, one stock goes down, we get the average. And Andy Lowe can talk about this at length. Um, but if we think about predicting, we actually get a bonus. The average prediction is actually more accurate than the average. So here's the top four predictors in that data set. They're 10%, 9%, 9%, and 8% better. If I hired the top four economists, I'd actually do 22% better. Now, what makes good groups good forecasters is the same thing as makes individuals good forecasters. So Phil Tetlock has done a lot of work on what he calls foxes and hedgehogs. Foxes are individuals who use many models who think about things in lots of different ways. If you look at, this is a massive, massive prediction contest, um, largest one ever run, run by the US intelligence community. Um, Phil had a team, I had a team, Phil's team one. Phil identified super forecasters who are 40% better than the average people in the population. When you train them, they got 10% better. But when you team them, you get another 10% lift. And when you aggregate them in the right way, taking into account diversity, you get another 35% lift. So what does this tell us? If I wanna have good forecast, find good people, they're basically 40% better. But if I want to have really good forecasts, when I want to find diverse teams of good people, because they're another 40% better. Now, here's a super interesting thing to sort of think about. And this is some work by Mark Cybers that just came out last year. If you look at humans and machines, so what you're seeing is the blue things are sort of machine only, the red ones are human only, and the green ones are hybrid. The left graph is accuracy. Hybrids are better. People were better at sort of classification than machines, but people plus machines were better than people. And the reason why is that I get the right graph, the correlation, this is the green part, the correlation between people and machines was much lower, right? Much more negative than the correlation among people or the correlation within machines. So because people and machines think differently, hybrid groups are actually better than um, either people or machines. Very quickly then problem solving. We can think of problem solving as like searching over a rugged landscape. You can construct a model where you have sort of diverse tools. And what you end up getting is that diverse groups of competent sort of algorithms will outperform the group of the best and typically by a substantial margin. And the logic here is the following. We tend to think in terms of ability when putting together teams. So it's like an alpha group and a diverse group, but we should actually think in terms of toolboxes. And we think of toolboxes, the alpha group may have all the same skills. So if I go visit the New York Fed, which I used to do on a regular basis pre-COVID, everybody in there has got the same tools. So this IL person, not is someone who maybe is a behavioral economist or maybe a sociologist or maybe an environmental scientist or maybe a China expert. On their own, they wouldn't be maybe that good at managing the economy, but in the group, they add a lot of value. Another way to think about this is that if people see the world differently, they have a different adjacent possibles. They can think of different stuff. One of the implications of this is that if you've got a complex task and team members bring different solutions and produce synergies, there's no test that you can apply to individuals that produces near optimal teams. So if I'm trying to find the best team, I shouldn't, I, there's no such thing as hiring the best people. That's just logically inconsistent. And Lou Hong have a re, and I have a recent paper that's under submission that generalizes this to a whole, a whole class of problems. So generally, no sort of test exists. Two last points, identity diversity, cognitive diversity, how does this play out? And, and how does leadership and management come into play? So Catherine Phillips was my co-author on a book on this. She says, here's the really interesting thing. When you look, identity diverse groups, socially diverse groups are actually the very best groups, right? So the cognitive diversity stuff makes sense, but why is it that identity diversity groups are? So when you think of identity diversity, we think of things like gender, race, age, this sort of stuff, right? Now there's reasoning effects. We tend to arrive at our opinions sort of intuitively and justify them. 
And so what happens is our lived experiences affect how we think about things. And so our identity diversity translates into cognitive diversity, which then we have a lot of sort of logic and math to explain why that gives us better outcomes. But it's tricky. I think 15, 20 years ago, people used to think we could take, pull out one part of our identities and map that into cognitive differences. Now the sort of state of the art is to say, no, actually we're bundled. Some people call this intersectionality, but the full bundle of people's characteristics affects the movies we watch, the books we read, the classes we take, the things we study. So who we are affects what we know, not for some essential reasons, you know, primarily because of sort of cultural and social reasons. Second really interesting thing that's kind of understudied, there's some nice work by Sandy Pentland at MIT on this, is that there's group effects. People think differently and harder when you're in an identity diverse group. Last thing, identity drives purpose. So I sometimes call this the Mary Oliver question. What do you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? This is driven by who you are. Okay, last point, then I'll be done, 30 seconds. It really does matter how a group is led, what the organizational culture is like, if you want the benefits from diversity to materialize, to actually produce collective intelligence. So again, if you look across all these research papers, all these patents, best groups are diverse, worst groups are diverse. You get 30 years of research, hundreds and hundreds of studies on groups and teams and organizations, best groups are diverse, worst groups are diverse. So management really matters. Within this kind of business case, then there's at the core, a human case. How do you motivate people? How do you help people grow? How do you make these teams function well? Let me just give sort of two um, almost identical views of this. You can think of this almost like a narrow corridor sort of argument. People have to, you have to care about people and you have to challenge them. Or as Amy Edmondson says, people have to feel safe and they have to feel motivated. If you care about people, you don't challenge them. You're in this ruinous empathy box, according to Jill. Um, but what you want to be is in this kind of radical candor box or this learning zone box. So people have to be challenged. This is almost like the selection part. I'm going to pull this back to Fisher's fundamental theorem. This is the selection stuff. You need diverse ideas, but you've got to, you know, kind of hold them up to the light. If people don't feel safe, if they don't feel cared for, you don't get the diversity from which you can select. And so one of the things that we're sort of coming back to from organizational theory, when you look at what makes diverse teams work really well, it's back to Fisher's fundamental theorem. You need the diversity to be materialized. You need people to feel safe, share, and bring it out. Then it has to be challenged and selected on. And if you do that, you end up getting this collective intelligence. So takeaways, once something's complex, you need diverse ability, you need cognitive diversity, different understandings, different representations, different models. Cognitive diversity and identity diversity are related in really interesting deep ways that we don't fully understand. And to get those benefits, what you need is inclusive leadership. And uh, hopefully Martin can build off that because he's sort of an expert in that area. Um, thank you. Um, I'm, I apologize for the light here, by the way. I'm in a, a broom cupboard in a conference. This is the only place I could find, but um, I'm just put my slides up. While you're doing that, Martin, I should just introduce you. I was mooted. So <laughs> Martin Rees is the chairman of BCG Henderson Institute. Um, so is living these things in, in, in practice and reality every day. So welcome, Martin. Thanks very much, uh, Scott and, and uh, Simon for some uh, I think we're very clear, uh, clearly laying out the, the biological principles and the, uh, the neurological principles of, of diversity. I want to maybe, uh, and I agree with, uh, I think, everything they said about the theory, which I see playing out in practice. So let me uh, maybe give some, some quick um, insights into how I see these things playing out in practice. Um, so first of all, um, the resilience um, or, or the uh, dynamic problem solving that, that both uh, Scott and Simon talked about, I'd say is, increasingly important. So here what you see is the, the competitive spread, the, uh, the difference in shareholder returns of, of companies over time, um, the, the difference between the, the, the best and the worst or the, or the top and the bottom quartile. And what we see is that over the last 50 years, uh, that spread has increased. And, um, and that's because essentially we're dealing with dynamic problems, not static optimization problems in business strategy. And furthermore, uh, in periods of volatility, such as uh, the, the COVID crisis, the Ukraine crisis, we see the, uh, the competitive spread um, increase by between 50 and 100%. So it's particularly important during crises and it's more important uh, over time, which is why business 
uh, essentially is in search of a, a dynamic uh, theory of strategy or, or complex problem solving. Um, the principles that Simon laid out um, uh, in his uh, Fragile Dominion book, uh, we would very much see as being a characteristic of the, of the companies that do well on dynamic problem solving uh, over time. Um, uh, 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 prudence, redundancy, diversity, modularity, adaptiveness. We'd add embeddedness, uh, namely the alignment between the social systems in which companies are embedded uh, and their uh, strategic and, 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 and business systems is, is very important over, uh, over long periods of time. And um, uh, so we find it actually uh, possible to operationalize these principles. So these principles break down into a set of practices that uh, resilient companies uh, employ uh, consistently and uh, non-resilient companies um, uh, de deploy, deploy less. And um, uh, roughly speaking, when we look at the most resilient companies, um, whether you look at the 2008 financial crisis or the, uh, or, or the COVID crisis, uh, the most resilient companies are employing about two thirds of these, uh, of these, uh, of these practices. Um, uh, so one of the problems we have with resilience is the slipperiness of the definition the and the ability to measure it. And uh, I think um, we, we, we can measure it um, uh, by, by looking at um, uh, outcome, performance outcomes over time. Essentially, uh, within any uh, industry sector, there's a spread of performance um, uh, during um, before, during, and after disturbances. And we can measure the area between the two curves. So we can measure um, uh, resilience and the repeatability of resilience across time. And um, one of the interesting things that emerges across that analysis, if you then cross that with the principles that time Simon talked about, is that um, we believe that resilience in practice in business uh, plays out um, on different time scales. So we have to think about the problem of anticipation um, or preparedness. Um, we have to think about the problem of absorption uh, of, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a shock environment, the immediate, uh, the immediate impact, uh, which can be you know, fatal in some cases. Bankrupt, bankruptcies tick up during uh, periods of crisis in business. We have to think about the ability to adapt um, uh, to, to changing circumstances. And uh, importantly, uh, the word resilience and robustness sort of imply um, some sort of avoidance of, 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 of downside risk. But I think we also have to have this sort of the upside uh, possibility of flourishing in, in changed circumstances. So our definition of resilience is essentially flourishing in uh, in, uh, in uh, the flourishing, flourishing under change on these four timescales. Um, and uh, if we're looking at human systems, I think we must add one more principle to, uh, to, to Simon's uh, biological principles, um, which is um, we must add intentionality and the capacity for imagination. So I think critically, the ability to flourish under new circumstances depends upon all of those uh, uh, issues of redundancy and modularity and diversity that Simon talked about and Scott talked about, but also the ability to, um, to reimagine, uh, to, to, to indulge in counterfactual thinking, to imagine futures which could exist and don't yet exist. And I'll show you a splendid example of that. So here is a, um, a chart from the, from the Walt Disney organization that apart from its uh, faded color of the paper, you may think that this is actually a map of uh, Walt Disney's um, uh, or the Disney, Disney Incorporated's um, actual current business model, because it's very, fairly close to the set of things that they do and the interrelationships between them. In fact, it was, um, this is about 30 years old. This is, um, uh, this is the imagined map of, 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 the, of Disney before it actually uh, existed. So I think the capacity of a collective imagination, as well as the capacity for you know, problem solving with uh, real world problems is an important part of this. Um, we, we would all agree that in practice, uh, diversity predicts growth. So we have um, a measure we call vitality, um, which is uh, uh, the predictive of, of future growth. One of the problems with business metrics is that they're mostly backward looking. They mostly predict what happened as opposed to what will happen. Uh, we have a, a, a back-tested model, which is um, uh, uh, contains 18 factors. And uh, uh, and uh, we now we've, we've now been running with, with it for about 10 years. And it's it's uh, it's not perfect, but it's it's better than um, uh, than any uh, financial indicators or market indicators of predicting future growth. And and so it's interesting to look at whether diversity, people diversity, uh, is uh, uh, is one of those factors. And it turns out to be. It's uh, um, uh, so so diversity is important. The problem here is that we across a large sample. This is this is all public companies, but um, for a large sample of companies, we can't predict, we can't actually measure all of the dimensions of diversity outside in, but for the ones we can measure, 
such as uh, gender and, and racial diversity and senior levels in the company, um, then it indeed uh, is, uh, is predictive of growth. Um, last point I want to make is um, maybe touching on some of the uh, issues that Scott raised on, uh, on uh, cognitive diversity. So um, I believe that the uh, diversity is differentially effective in different environments. So I think that strategy is not one thing, according to the unpredictability of the environment, which varies between industries and over time, the malleability of those environments, can we actually shape those environments and the harshness of those environments? Actually, effective strategy consists of very different cognitive uh, uh, operations. So for example, classical strategy in predictable environments is essentially a planning problem. Uh, that is a very specific type of problem. Um, adapting to a, uh, uh, an, uh, an unknowable or unpredictable uh, in, environment, uh, such as a nascent uh, in, industry, is a totally different type of problem. That's more one of, of adaptation. Creating something entirely new in the world is more like an exercise in, uh, uh, in, in imagination. It's a, it's, it's, it's a visionary problem. It's a creative problem. Um, so one of the things we've, uh, we did with, uh, uh, with Simon is to create a, 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 what we call a universal strategy simulator, which is actually a, a population of multi-armed bandits, which is able to simulate all of these different strategic environments. And we asked the question, um, what sort of skills um, are applicable uh, in, in each of these environments? So we have a game and we have a large population of gameplay data uh, to, to measure um, you know, who's good at these different strategic environments. And then uh, my last slide, we, we then teamed up with a company called Pymetrics that measures, um, so there are about 90 uh, well-documented um, neuroscience traits that are also, that are also diagnosable if, um, through games. And we combine that with the, the strategy gameplay data. And we asked the question, what are the skills of effective strategists? And what we found was that uh, the skills that you require, the neuroscience skills that you require, which are the uh, the rows on this chart were actually different according to the strategic environment. The second thing we found was that there were very few, only about 1% of universally gifted strategists, that different people had different collections of, uh, of skills. And, and therefore, actually, uh, it's more or less a statistical necessity, and you're extremely good at uh, recruiting and figuring out the environments that you'll face, which is, of course, ne nearly impossible, then you need a, uh, a cognitively diverse team uh, across uh, across a population of environments, and any large company is usually seeing all of these environments uh, in in uh, simultaneously uh, in different parts of the business. So, uh, so bottom line, I think uh, resilience is increasingly important. Um, I think it's measurable. Um, I think it uh, very much depends upon the sort of uh, traits that, uh, that that Simon Scott talked about. Diversity is a key one, uh, and I think we begin to see the connection between. Uh, the, the, the skills that you need in particular strategic environments uh, and the neuroscience traits that you can, you can actually recruit for and, and select for to make sure that you have the right sort of cognitive, cognitively diverse teams. Thank you so much, Martin. Uh, that was a wonderful synthesis and more than a synthesis added to the discussion. Um, and that concludes the first session. Um, and we move, have to move, unfortunately, directly to the second session because of time constraints. So uh, those very rich presentations, I'm sure, stimulated uh, some questions and queries. But if you hold those till after the third session, we, we will have um, a fairly lengthy time for being able to ask questions of various speakers. So now we will move to session two, which is entitled Diversity for Market Prosperity. And our first speaker is Kathleen Sigerson, who is professor of economics at University of Connecticut, and she's going to be talking about diversity and environmental economics perspectives. So welcome, Kathleen. Thank you. Let me just uh, go ahead and share my screen here. Is that visible to everyone, I hope? Yep, it's good. Okay. Okay, great. So um, thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, I have to just be clear up front that unlike the previous speakers, I have not written a book on diversity. This is not an area that is my particular area of expertise. So I'm really coming at this from a bit of an outsider's perspective. And, and the perspective I bring is one of an environmental economist. So in that sense, it's an economic perspective, um, but it's an environmental economics perspective. And I think the reason that might be notable is because um, it influences how we think about what we're trying to achieve in some sense. So here the focus 
of the discussion of economics has been on resilient corporations and sustaining corporations. And um, environmental economists, I think, typically think about the objectives being uh, more of a social welfare maximization. And so that may or may not involve sustaining certain types of markets or certain types of corporations. And so I think that's a question that perhaps is something that we, we could um, discuss a little bit um, maybe during the discussion section. Um, so let me, oh, why am I not? Uh, okay, so, so let me just start by um, saying that I'm gonna approach this from a very kind of general high level perspective. This is intended to be a dialogue is my understanding. So I'm gonna to try to just make some comments that perhaps, um, as I said, put this in, in a slightly different perspective and, and generate some, some discussion. But the, the goal here, as I understand it, is to do two things, try to first um, define what are the key values of diversity and secondly, to identify potential trade-offs for embracing diversity and transformations needed for more resilient and, and sustainable markets. So again, I underline the resilient and sustainable here because those terms and what they mean and the extent to which we want to um, have those as our objectives, I think can vary depending upon the circumstances. So um, let me start by saying that I think it's, in my view, very important to think about diversity as a means toward an end rather than an end in and of itself. And maybe that's obvious to this group, but usually when I hear discussions about diversity, it's very often in the context of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so the word diversity is put alongside equity and inclusion as though these are parallel in some sense concepts. And I think that even in the, the DEI context, that diversity is, is a means toward, toward an end and the value of that diversity will depend upon what the end is that we're trying to achieve. So um, just to give an example, even in the context of say hiring, um, whether it's fa university faculty or any kind of a, of a worker in an organization, um, we often see that an objective is to get a diverse pool of applicants. We want to do our best to advertise broadly to get a diverse pool. And and so then the question is why? Why is it that we think that we need a diverse pool? And there are a number of possible reasons that we might give for wanting diversity at this level. Um, one is simply because we want to be fair. So this is the equity and inclusion part of DEI, that we want to be fair in terms of opening up opportunities to a broad range of um, people within a population, not excluding certain segments of the population. Um, alternatively, we might think that by being more diverse, we will somehow have a better chance of getting the most qualified people into that pool. So our objective is really not one of inclusion and equity, but more of getting the most qualified individual hired for the position. Um, we might think that given the workforce that we currently have, that by bringing in a more diverse set of um, applicants, we would foster this cross fertilization that we've heard about um, in a lot of detail from, from Scott Page in terms of how it increases productivity. So that might be the objective, or it might be that we're looking to serve a particular population, whether it be customers or students, and we want to have people in our organization that in some sense look like the people that we're trying to serve because we feel that that will allow us to better serve those uh, populations or provide role models for them. So all of these are in some sense different reasons for wanting diversity and they have different implications for what the value of that diversity is, both how we define it and how we measure it. Um, and they also have different implications for what we wanna do once with the diverse pool once we have it, what our actual hiring strategy would be once we have that diverse pool. So thinking about diversity as a means toward an end and being very explicit about what is the objective here that we're trying to accomplish, I think is a critical part of this concept of valuing diversity. But even then, I think it's important to think about the various ways in which diversity might be in some sense defined. And we've heard a little bit about these um, already in the discussions, but they've been put under a single umbrella of diversity. And I would again think, argue that there's some value in parsing out the different components. And so, so let me try to do that a bit. Um, so one is to think about diversity as basically heterogeneity. Uh, Simon mentioned this, he used the terms diversity and heterogeneity, I think it's almost interchangeably. I'm not sure if that's quite accurate, Simon, but I'd be interested in your perspective on that. 
Um, and so in, a, you know, in an economic context, um, we could think about that in terms of um, product variety and the output markets. And then the question is, why do we have or why do we want product variety? Why would a firm want to produce a variety of products? And it may be to satisfy heterogeneous preferences. So maybe the heterogeneity is on the preference side for the individuals who are, who are consumers or purchasers or customers of that, of that corporation. Different people with different preferences want different things. Um, but it also might stem from heterogeneity, a preference for heterogeneity. Basically, any individual likes a variety of things. And so that's, a, again, a very different notion of heterogeneity. It's within a person as opposed to across people. Um, in the environmental area, we also see heterogeneity that stems from heterogeneous regulations. For example, the varying fuel economy standards in different states lead to firms having to produce different products to be sold in different states to meet the regulations in those states. And in some sense, we can think of those heterogeneous regulations as reflecting heterogeneous um, preferences or circumstances in, across those states. And so again, the value of that product diversity depends upon what it is that it's trying to achieve. And then of course, there's a cost associated with producing a variety of products as opposed to a single one. And I think this notion of a cost of diversity is something that is um, important to keep in mind. Um, I don't know that it was uh, emphasized in the previous uh, speaker's comments, but I, I'm going to put some emphasis on that here. So this is one idea of heterogeneity, product variety, but I think the more uh, relevant one for this discussion is probably on the input side rather than the output side. And thinking about different types of variation, different types of heterogeneity, identity um, heterogeneity, as was indicated by Scott Page, whether it be racial, ethnic, gender, linguistic, age, education, or just having a greater number of, in some sense, competing entities. This is comes out of a paper that um, Steve Pulaski wrote with Dave Tillman. Um, but I would argue that competition per se doesn't require heterogeneity. You can certainly have competition with a, a large number of identical firms. So again, the key here would be competition coupled with some kind of heterogeneity across the competing factors. Um, but again, I think it's important to recognize that uh, increased heterogeneity or diversity has both benefits and costs and at both the organizational level in terms of firm performance or productivity. I'm sorry? Sorry, sorry, please. Somebody should mute. Somebody should mute themselves. Can you hear me if I keep speaking over that? Yeah, yeah. We'll oh, I think it's muted. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Oh, sorry about that. Um, somebody got unmuted there. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, so I think it's important to think about this both at the organizational level, and that's kind of the focus that we've had so far, but also more broadly at the societal level. And um, I've just finished reading um, Oded Galore's book, The Journey of Humanity on the Origins of Wealth and Inequality. Um, and I think he has a very interesting perspective on this at the level of social diversity as opposed to organizational diversity. But I think the principles are the same. So, you know, he argues basically that there are a lot of benefits associated with social diversity of the type that we've just heard about, widening the spectrum of individual traits that gives you know, broader skills in terms of problem solving, specialization, cross fertilization organization, ability to adapt, et cetera. But he also notes the um, costs associated with greater social diversity by, by widening the spectrum of individual values, beliefs, and preferences. Uh, findings suggest that you can erode interpersonal trust, social cohesion, um, increase the incidence of civil conflicts, and introduce inefficiencies in the provision of public goods, et cetera, and that these can negatively affect economic performance or economic growth. Um, and this is quantitatively important in the sense that it, the estimates suggest that about a quarter of the unexplained variation in prosperity between nations um, uh, was attributable to societal diversity. So um, he argues that there's sort of an optimal amount or a sweet spot for the level of social diversity that promotes um, human well being. And that balances the benefits associated with all of the things we've heard about already, um, operating both, as we said, at the organizational level, but also at the um, societal level, balances that against the costs associated with this fractionalization in some sense that. Um, that leads to more conflict, more um, less trust, et cetera. And so in some sense, the implication of that is um, that we have, um, if we look at what increased diversity does, if it's good or bad in some sense, that's gonna vary depending upon the circumstances. Um, 
Another idea of diversity, though, is simply this notion of bundling correlated risks. So now, even though the previous discussion didn't hinge in any way on uncertainty, um, correlating, uh, bundling uncorrelated risks is only relevant, obviously, in the context where you want to diversify to, to pool your risks. And this is obviously relevant in the financial um, sector. It's also relevant in some environmental sectors as well, um, in particular in thinking about collective quotas in contexts like fisheries. So, so that's a second concept, but a third concept is really just one of having more options, having a diversity of options in some sense. And clearly more options we generally think of as a better, as a better thing. So for example, trade, economists typically think of as being a good thing because it opens up more options. Although it's clear that trade can also have costs associated with it. Extreme example, of course, is the slave trade, but even in less extreme examples, we can talk about the costs associated with trade. Um, so options, more options isn't always necessarily leading to um, positive results, at least for everyone. Um, a variation on this, and so what I termed here as diversity three plus is you know, having more options, not just because more options are better, but as an ability to respond to new shocks or new information. So the concept of you know, response diversity that um, is discussed by, I think a number of ecologists have used this term and we've certainly used it in a recent paper that a group of, of us are working on. So this would be the idea, for instance, that you know, if you have an economy that has a diverse um, base, it's not, it's not solely dependent on a single sector that it can better withhold or withstand shocks um, that might come along down the road. Of course, by doing that, by diversifying, you, you lose some of the within industry agglomeration economies that you might otherwise be able to, to benefit from. Um, also, obviously, having a diversity of trading partners gives you other options when it comes to um, being able to respond to supply disruptions, et cetera. And particularly in the environmental area, there's been um, discussion about the concept of what's called quasi-option value. Uh, it's basically maintaining flexibility. Simon talked about the importance of that, maintaining flexibility to respond. And what you might wanna do is make sure that you keep options open so that you have that flexibility. Um, but this very much depends upon um, the options to, you know, if. It depends upon irreversibility. So basically the idea that I can't undo what I've done before when I find out that in fact it was a mistake to have um, lost something that I, that I now wish I had back. Um, it doesn't depend on risk aversion. We haven't really said anything about risk aversion here yet, but I think it's an important concept in some, in some contexts. And so the applications in the environmental area are to questions about you know, preserving unique uh, landscapes rather than developing them, um, climate change, obviously irreversibility is there, and, and biodiversity, which perhaps um, Steve will talk about, Steve and Elena will talk about in the last uh, section. And then, so the question really is, you know, what does any of this mean? And I think I would just sort of summarize the points I'd like to make by saying it's important to think about the goal um, when we think about uh, resilient and sustainable markets. Is that from an economic perspective? Is that from an environmental perspective? Environmental economists usually think about environmental sustainability rather than just economic sustainability. There are clearly some markets like the fossil fuel markets where we wouldn't be able to sustain them in the long run and we wouldn't necessarily want to. Um, we certainly wouldn't want to. So I think we need to be uh, careful about what we mean by and why we want to uh, have resilient and sustainable markets. What role does diversity play uh, in sustaining those markets? What's the value? And I would argue that depends upon what the goal is and we need to be explicit about that and be explicit about what we mean by diversity, whether it's just heterogeneity or we're interested in risk pooling or we're interested in flexibility. Um, those are very different concepts there. And the question I think in the end is um, recognizing that there are both benefits and costs. And so is there sort of this sweet spot that um, we might think about in terms of an optimal amount of diversity? So thank you very, thank thank you very much. You know, thank you, Kathleen Ferguson. That was um, a wonderful introduction to this second session. And uh, now we'll continue on with um, a presentation by Andrew Lowe, who is Professor of Finance and the Director of the Laboratory of Financial Engineering at MIT. And the topic he's gonna to speak about is diversity in adaptive financial markets. Andrew. Great, thank you very much. Can you uh, all hear me okay? All good. Great. Yes. Um, so first I wanna start by thanking Long Chen and the Lohan Academy for convening this meeting. Uh, and uh, I wanna thank uh, them and, and Regina uh, for inviting me to participate in today's event. 
You know, when I was first uh, asked to, to join this uh, meeting on diversity, you know, my inclination was, you know, I, I don't really know much about it uh, because uh, like Kathy, my impression of diversity at the time was, oh, you're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI. That's a, you know, a, a buzz phrase that has made a lot of uh, rounds uh, in academic circles, particularly at MIT, where we've had a lot of controversy about the so-called cancel culture, where speakers have been canceled because of certain things that they said that other people don't agree with. And so there's a concern among academics about the lack of diversity, equity, and inclusion. But as a financial economist, I'm not an expert in that issue. So my first reaction to Regina's kind invitation was, uh, thanks, but I, I don't really think I have much to say about the DEI. And then I get an email from Simon, uh, who uh, I, I realize is really behind this meeting. And as soon as I, I know that Simon is involved and, uh, and, and other uh, colleagues of his, like Scott Page and, and Josh Plotkin, uh, uh, and Martin Reeves, um, many of whom have inspired uh, my own thinking in this area, I, I thought, okay, well, now that makes sense. Um, so what I thought I would do in my 15 minutes is to focus on the role of diversity in financial markets, since that's the area that I focus on. Um, and um, it, I don't know how many of you can see my uh, little square, but uh, if, you, if it's small, you may wanna uh, you know, use the pin function or Regina, you can spotlight uh, my, uh, my image so you can see the screen. It's good, Andy. Okay, great. So I wanna start uh, with a, an observation, which is that um, typically when people use terms barred from evolutionary biology and ecology, things like uh, mutation, innovation, selection, and so on, they're using it metaphorically. And uh, so the, the, the notion that all the world's a stage by Shakespeare or that hedge funds are the Galapagos Islands of finance, those are metaphors. But I wanna argue that the idea of evolution in finance is not metaphorical, it's literal. Literal in the sense that biological processes are one mechanism by which selection affects population characteristics but financial evolution, uh, the interaction between money, markets, and financial decisions is a different mechanism by which selection also affects population characteristics, albeit survival of the richest, not necessarily the fittest in the biological context. And so the point is that when we talk about evolution in financial markets, it's important to understand that this is not just some kind of qualitative discussion. It's really applying the principles of natural selection or financial selection to market dynamics. In both cases, both biological and financial selection, you're trying to model the impact of selection on the population, uh, even though the mechanisms are different. So obviously the propagation of characteristics of traits uh, you know, in, in biology is through genetic uh, uh, mechanisms. Those mechanisms are different in financial selection, but nonetheless, there is an evolutionary process going on that we can understand. And so in this book that I published a few years ago on adaptive markets, I apply the principles of evolutionary biology and ecology to financial contexts. And in these you know, five basic principles, you can actually see evolution at work, albeit a different type of evolution. And I'm gonna just go through uh, a, a couple of examples. So I wanna to turn to this notion of diversity in adaptive markets. We've already heard from the first session and from Kathy's comments about what we mean by diversity. Certainly from a financial perspective, the notion of diversification is really hardwired into virtually everything that we study. But I think that diversity has a broader set of meanings uh, in, in financial markets that I would be useful to consider. And so I wanna focus on the idea of why diversity is so important. Uh, we know from Aristotle that nature abhors a vacuum. And I think by that same token, uh, I, I've written uh, in a number of contexts that nature also abhors an undiversified bet. Uh, now, this is counter to a number of investment principles that particularly venture capitalists focus on. Uh, you know, Warren Buffett uh, has famously uh, dismissed the notion of diversification uh, by pointing out that instead of not putting all your eggs in one basket, 
he prefers to put all his eggs in one basket and then watch that basket very carefully. Now, if you're Warren Buffett and you're really good at watching you know, eggs in baskets, maybe you don't have to worry about diversification. But for the rest of us, diversification is actually a very powerful principle. And in nature, an undiversified bet, meaning traits that are really focused on a very narrow set of environmental conditions, is a recipe for disaster. Because as we know, the environment is stochastic. And when those environmental uh, challenges change, if we, are not undiver if we are not diversified, we risk extinction. You know, a good example of that is what all of us lived through over the past two years with COVID-19. Uh, we, we've been saved by the vaccines that uh, several companies, particularly uh, Moderna and uh, Pfizer and uh, BioNTech have developed. It's kind of sobering to realize that BioNTech and Moderna did not exist as companies 20 years ago. Think, think about that. It's within the last 20 years that the two companies that saved our, our, our society, that, that developed these vaccines, that, that saved us in the past two years, they, they did not exist two decades ago. And so I, I, said, I would say that we, we escaped a, a much, much greater disaster in the pandemic by the skin of our teeth, thanks to the diversity of the, the biotechnology industry. So, the question that I want to put to you is, what if we studied finance the way that ecologists study their particular environments? What, what if we looked at, say, the financial crisis, and instead of focusing on it from the typical financial theory or financial empirical analysis, suppose instead we focused on the financial crisis from an ecological perspective and do what ecologists do, which is to study the flora, the fauna, to to measure the biomass of various keystone species and ask what the predator and prey relationships are in that context. So I wanna give you an example of this. I wanna focus on one very specific issue surrounding the financial crisis and look at the, the, the financial economics as well as the, the ecology of this particular challenge. And that has to do with the so-called too big to fail phenomenon. I'm going to start with an example of Bank of America. This is a U.S. bank that uh, a number of us uh, are uh, do business with. Um, I think many people on this call from the U.S. have accounts at Bank of America. And I want to take you back to uh, 2008 when the Bank of America got overextended and had to be bailed out by the U.S. government. You may not remember this because it's a while ago, but in the fall of 2008, Bank of America required a $25 billion capital injection by the U.S. government in order to uh, stave off uh, insolvency and ultimately a failure of the bank. Fall of 2008, we had to inject $25 billion into this institution. January of two 2009, we had to add an additional $20 billion to Bank of America, plus a $118 billion guarantee on their balance sheet. And in March of 2009, we added another $5.2 billion by bailing out AIG that was able to was supposed to provide a $5.2 billion payout to Bank of America because of some credit default swaps. So it was pretty clear throughout the financial crisis that Bank of America, along with a number of other institutions, were systemically important and were too big to fail. We could not let this particular institution fail. So you would think that we learned our lesson, didn't we? We learned our lesson back in 2008, and we have since made sure that there aren't such uh, point, single points of failure. We, we, we decided that we, we need to have more diversity in the financial system, right? Well, let's take a look at it. In 2005, well before the financial crisis occurred, how big was Bank of America? And, and these are some numbers that you might be familiar with, those of you who are economists that study banking. In 2005, three years before this financial crisis, the total revenues of Bank of America was about 57 billion. Their assets were about 1.3 trillion. 
the size of their loans and leases, about a half a trillion. They had about 600 million in deposits. And in terms of total headcount, uh, they had about 176,000 people employed in this one institution. Okay, so that was 2005. So naturally, since then, we've corrected the problem, right? So that Bank of America is now no longer too big to fail. So let's take a look at just how big uh, Bank of America is. Uh, if we actually look at their size as of 2000, whoops, sorry, get this out of the way. If we, get, if we look at their size as of 2021, their total revenues are nearly double. Their total assets are more than double. If you look at their loans and lease, that's also about double. Their deposits are close to four times the size of 2005, and they've increased their headcount as well. Now, these are in 2021 dollars. If you convert that to 2005 dollars, you can see that in every single category, Bank of America is even bigger than it was. So if you thought this bank was too big to fail, well, it's even bigger now. And if we now go to a paper that was published in 2006 by Helen Janicki and Ed Prescott uh, through the Richmond Fed, they actually did a study of the concentration problem in the banking industry from 1960 to 2005. And it, but both by measure of the number of independent banks, as well as the market share of the 10 largest banks, this too big to fail problem has been going on for decades and it continues. If you had update these graphs to today, you would see that the problem has gotten worse. And so the question about why there is this loss in diversity, why we have such concentration is a serious problem. I'm not gonna tell you the answer. Uh, for economists, I think we've figured out the answer, uh, but the larger issue is why we haven't done anything about it. And this is why we need to study these issues from an ecological perspective. If we approach this as an ecologist might, by cataloging the flora and fauna of the financial system, by documenting the keystone species, the symbiotic relationships among the various different species, and understanding exactly what the relationships are, it actually becomes clear why it is that these institutions are too big to fail and continue to grow. If we then measure the foraging behavior of these species, the environmental pressures and the adaptive responses, we can then begin to craft policy to address these issues. The current policies clearly aren't working. And so the, the loss of diversity is something that we really have to be concerned about. Finally, by asking the, what the role of size is in financial institutions and a number of, of both economists, as well as ecologists and evolutionary biologists, including Martin, Simon, Scott, Josh, and others, if we try to understand the role of size in this particular ecosystem, uh, and there is a, an example, uh, uh, one of uh, Simon's colleagues, John Bonner, published a book years ago on why size matters in biology. I think we, we can begin to think about what to do about it. So a number of speakers have already talked about the fact that, that diversity brings us robustness, resilience, sustainability, and longevity. And so in some work that Simon and I have done both on thinking about uh, financial regulation from an evolutionary perspective and in a recent uh, PNAS volume on applying evolutionary models to financial markets, I think there are clear answers on what we can do to promote diversity in the financial system uh, and to, to measure it, uh, to therefore be able to manage it. Uh, and I look forward to the conversations with all of the participants at this meeting, because I think that we really need to have this multi multidisciplinary approach to this extraordinarily complex and adaptive system. Thank you. Thank you, um, <clears throat> Andrew Lowe. And uh, so now I would like to invite the discussant for this session, Long Chen, who is director of Ruan Academy, uh, to make his remarks. Um, Long? Thank you very much. So let me uh, 
I'm trying to find my my slides. Um, oh boy. So oh, it's here. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, good. Of course. So it's my great pleasure to listen to Cassie and Andy and the previous guests and now comment on the subject. As Cassie said, diversity has been emphasized a lot in organizations as evidence of good company, but rarely can people explain why it is so. Today I have learned a lot and gave me the chance actually to sorry. To give me the chance to um, think about why really diversity matters in organizations <clears throat> and especially in the digital era. So I'm not an expert on the subject, but in the spirit of diversity, I participate. Now I think a general theme, as Andy pointed out, is that diversity matters by impacting the dynamics of complex systems. Most of the current social and economic challenges are related to complex and social systems, such as climate change, fight against COVID, financial crisis, and globalization. Now, so in those complex systems, people are diverse, diverse in terms of information, incentive and specialized capacities. Such diversity inevitably leads to different output. And diverse output could be desirable, both in natural environments and in business competition. And the breakdown of complex systems is often caused by uniform response from diverse participants. And they can turn uncorrelated risk into highly correlated ones. Now, so let's take finance as example. So institu in institutions and peoples and the products and market participants, they are all diverse. And, but in well-functioning markets, it leads to efficient market outcome and resource allocation. But then as the per financial products become complicated, information asymmetry could become more severe and under shocks, with asymmetric information, response becomes uniform. And there's uniform panic from diverse participants. And then that causes information cascade, runs fire sales, and liquidity and credit crash, credit, credit crunch. So liquidity spiral amplifies the shocks and it leads to fully scaled crisis. And as Marcus Brennemeyer, another Lohan Academy member has uh, wrote earlier. So I think there are a couple of two, uh, a couple of key takeaways here. The first is that a transparent and effective information exchange among diver div diversified participants plays a key role. The second is that if those diversified agents have the ability and information to make decisions, the result, the dynamics of this social of this complex system will be different. And I think that diversity can also be a driving force of innovation. And I'm gonna cite several uh, people's uh, comment on this. And as Brian Moore author, another Bahan Academy uh, distinguished fellow and uh, top point out that the nature of technology is really to, to combine the different ingredients together. To, uh, which leads the innovation. So of course, so I think that uh, then diversity is the uh, precondition of for this to happen. And as Paul Roma talk about the non-rivalry goods and combinational uh, explosion explains why in the digital age, there's much more uh, innovations. Uh, nowadays, you know, much more innovations. And so, so also the, uh, what this really says is that uh, if we have the diversity of effective decision-making units and the transparent information flow, they are 
most powerful ways for individuals, firms, and organizations to be sustainable in a UK world, which means essentially it's a vague, uncertain, complicated, and uh, ambiguous world. Now, so, and I think here, uh, the relation be in between the relation between diversity and the complex system, uh, information plays a key role. And that I think is because if each agents, they have different information incentive and constraints, and so they deal with this differently and the interaction matters. And for any successful organizations or access or successful um, complex system to be sustainable, it should have the capacity to promote information transparency. It elicits the wisdom of the crowd, of the individuals, as Scott mentioned, to help individuals to make the better decisions and they have, if they have more complex information, they have better tools to coordinate. And also if that enables them to respond to shocks and make adjustment more swiftly and even in real time. And I think on that regard, digitization plays a key role. And as we all know that digitization has uh, have revolutionized the cost of creating and exchanging uh, information. So at, Nowadays that the information can be exchanged in really close real time, and there's a lot of feedbacks happening. And that really is reshaping how individuals, they acquire information, they co coordinate with each other. That enables a lot of individuals' units within the complex system to, to, get them to, have, to, to be able to make diverse decisions and they can, they can coordinate with each other swiftly. Now, I'm gonna give you uh, several examples since I'm working uh, nowadays in a technology company to see, I think how digitized information is play, play a key role by changing the relation between the diversity and the, and the organizations or uh, complex systems. But one example is, I'm good, I'm here what I'm showing is a digital factory, it's called the Xunxi Digital Factory. And in that factory, so this is in the uh, close, uh, uh, a clothes making industry. And as we know in the, for clothes, they have fashions and the fashions phase changes very fast. And therefore, traditionally, uh, clothing ma makers, they have to make orders like the, at least half years before. And it's very hard for them to change the inventory if the, if the uh, uh, trends, the fashion change. But nowadays, actually this whole thing can be done within 10 days because there's a lot more a quicker information and as with that so digitized information with the automation of the of the uh, manufacturing process that makes this whole thing much more effective so nowadays we have much quicker reaction we have much flexible production and we have more uh, uh, personalized items that can be made uh, much swiftly so that give you a, 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 so we have much diversified products at a much swifter uh, a, a shift of the production. Now, a, a second example is the coordination within the organizations. So nowadays across the world in the United States, we have Teams. In China, we have the Talk and other apps. Nowadays, they actually, those, those apps, not only you can have the conference calls like the Zooms and share the documents, actually it can help each individual actually to, uh, within the organization, more and more organizations, this is use this kind of digitized, digitized coordination uh, platform. They are able to uh, coordinate with each other. They are mo most, more importantly, we can measure their individual in, uh, product productions more precisely. And so that builds trust uh, among the diversified individuals. And that also releases the power that gives the individual workers uh, much more freedom. And now that, that promotes the uh, working at home, you know, all those kind of stuff. So that's really the future of coordination within the organizations. Thanks for the sharing of the information, measurement of the performance. Now, let me give you a third, third example that uh, coordinates what I think uh, Cassie said earlier. And if you look at the, what this says is the, on the e-commerce market and, and on the left panel, you can see that it's, this is the correlation between the to, uh, uh, to random consumers. What is the correlation between their uh, preference? Does preference uh, 
is the preference diversified. And if the preference is very highly coordinated, you're going to see a lighter uh, uh, color, and which is you can see from the from the, uh, uh, from the line. But you can see that there's very little correlation of their preferred items, which means on the on the demand side, it is very diversified. Um, now, which is output, but you can see actually the output on the platforms. But most of the increase of the products is really through the variety. So companies, uh, sellers, they compete through a variety from the output variety, not through the identical products as we learn from just textbook economics. So variety matters because demand is various and the ability to produce varied goods is crucial for the uh, business in today's environment. And the last example I gave is going to correspond to what Andy has talked about. And so I think, and I think I really appreciate Andy's point. What I'm trying to add on to that is that I think that different ways to deal with this systematic risk. Let me give you a couple of real time examples. So back because the COVID is also another kind of systematic shock. And I'm giving you some examples of the my bank. You can see on the left panel uh, as the as the, uh, as the COVID shock happens, as you can see from the red line, that is the default rate. And probability of default, probability of default within 30 days just shot, uh, uh, shoot up quickly. But in the meantime, you can see that there's very quick adjustment of the lending strategy. So that is the admission rate should just change the, uh, dramatically is that first one. So because you have the big data information, you are able to make the decision much quick, much quicker, swiftly than before. On the right panel, you can see that actually not only you can make the swifter decisions, actually you can even allow for more newcomers. So actually the, the people getting the, 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 the financial support is not reduced. You can, you can still find the people who have the capacity, but they are really need the money, but they have the ability. So because of the much more information, what I'm trying to say is that traditionally, from my understanding in finance, because of asymmetric information, we we kind of we try to assess the probability of default, then we have some kind of reserve to prepare for that. Now, there's another way to do it. I'm not saying it's going to completely replace that, but I think that's really crucial because we're seeing this really happening happening for the uh, fintech uh, industry uh, across the world, uh, especially uh, in China. That is, you actually you can have much uh, prompt real time information to make you to adjust. So not you don't rather than estimating the given probability of default, you change the probability exposure much quicker. That is another way to do it. Uh, so and uh, another point I just said corresponds to what Andy said. Imagine that if we have much better uh, transparent exchange of information, that helps us really to deal with. All kinds of shocks, including COVID, including the, the the financial crisis. In that case, then that actually there won't be as much uniform panic. That is, I think that this matter is a lot of that is the uh, is is the panic, and that can be reduced. I'm not saying all risk will be reduced, but I think that more ways to deal with uh, in the digital era. Uh, so that is what what I have learned. So. Anyway, let me summarize. Uh, summarize in 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 end. I think that um, diversity really uh, matters by impacting the, the 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 dynamics of the complex system. And what I'm really emphasizing here is that in between the uh, diversity and the uh, complex system, uh, information uh, plays a key role. And the so as and that I think. It, it plays the there's a couple of two key two points that can be taken away from the organizations. One is that the transparency and effective information exchange are crucial for what well, we want to have diversity. But in addition to that, if we have digitized information, if we have transparent, effective information exchanging, that it really enable them, and that uh, will help them to make diversified decision making ability. And so. So I guess my point is that the diversity matters for the dynamics of the complex systems and digital information revolution plays a key role by reshaping that relation. 
It's thus reshaping how we organize ourselves and coordinate with each other. Thank you. Thank you, Long Chen, for that, that summary. That that's terrific. Um, and uh, so now we're moving um, rapidly as we're we're tied on time to our session, our third session, uh, in which we change the focus a little bit to look at the value of biodiversity and connecting human and natural systems. And our first speaker um, is Professor Elena Bennett, who's Professor and Canada Research Chair in Sustainability Science at McGill University. And Dr. Bennett will be talking about the notion of diversity and robustness of ecosystems. So over to you, Elena. Uh, so uh, I just want to uh, start by um, thanking the Lohan Academy for inviting me to be here. Uh, it's been thrilling to listen to all the rest of the, the speakers and discussants so far. And so thanks to, to everyone for the really uh, interesting insights and I'm, I'm looking forward to more conversation that we can can have on this. Um, so uh, I, I can't remember who said it before, but someone said, you know, when they got this invitation, uh, maybe it was Professor Lowe thought, oh, I'm not really a diversity scientist. And I, I have to admit, I had a little bit of the same uh, uh, response, my, my own self, but uh, started thinking about, you know, what is it that I could offer to this conversation. So with that in mind, I'm going to going to take a, a fairly high level approach and focus in on some of the, the ecological and social ecological system side. And, and to that end, I'll just start making sure we're all on the same page about that from a biological sense. And, um, you know, diversity has been a really hot topic. Uh, a center of ecological attention for for really almost 50 years from you know first being explored by Thomas Lovejoy in 1980 uh, where we were talking about biological diversity then a shortened form uh, starting maybe in the late uh, 80s and and so far today we've really talked about the role primarily of diversity in in social systems and in financial systems and organizations. So I wanna just touch a little bit on the, the ecological point of view uh, that we might take about diversity. And, and you know, in ecology, if I just summarize that, it's really just a way of thinking about the variety of life at multiple scales and in multiple ways. So I'll start with just a little bit of background, make sure uh, we're all uh, using terms in the same way and on the same page so that you can get a sense of where I'm, I'm coming from. Uh, so when we talk about diversity in ecology, um, that includes you know, all the animals, all the plants, the insects, the microorganisms, and, and that really is species diversity. And that's maybe the first thing that comes to mind when you hear an ecologist say uh, diversity. And uh, it's important to point out that's not just the, the species that we see or know about, um, but ones that we don't as well. Uh, it also includes though, uh, where these species live and how they connect and how they interact. And that's what we might call ecosystem uh, diversity. And it includes uh, the genetic makeup of each living being that we might call uh, genetic diversity. And to me, it's really important to start there because I think in ecology, we, we say biodiversity and we're using that often as a shorthand for species diversity, but the reality is, is much bigger and that these other forms of diversity at other scales are really important and have uh, a really important impact on the resilience of, of ecosystems and social ecological systems and landscapes um, because they're um, influencing the potential and the actual responses to a bunch of different stressors that we might put on those systems. So um, uh, if we, we look at why for, for a minute uh, and, and hone in, for example, on, on genetic diversity, the inter-individual diversity of genes, and that's going to affect the adaptive potential of a species in the face of, of environmental change. So diversity in this sense helps to maintain the viability of populations. It increases the survival uh, potential of a, of a species essentially by providing uh, different potentials, different opportunities that could be taken advantage of and carried uh, forward through natural selection. Um, 
so, uh, so species diversity gives us the number of species in a given area, influences the potential and resilience of an ecosystem. If I scale that up a little bit, ecosystem diversity uh, is about the, the ecological interactions of ecosystems, and it's going to influence the, the resilience of landscapes. So why it, it works that way, if we think uh, about, about species diversity, each species, so that's uh, one of these little bumps here, uh, has some sort of ecological function of some uh, intensity and some amount. Uh, and those functions together provide for our ecosystem some sort of stability in the face of different stressors. And redundancy, which is kind of the, the overlap um, uh, in those, those little bumps means that we can retain a function even if we might lose uh, one of the species. So, uh, so what diversity does in that sense is provide a number of different elements that, that influence ecosystem function. So I think about that as being, uh, it's, it's the, the diversity of information that the system uh, needs. So if we dig into that a little bit more and, and ask ourselves, well, why is that, um, uh, uh, important, um, we can think about the role that these different components play in providing different options. And that's an idea that's come up in several uh, talks before, this idea of diversity as, as a series of options. And so systems in this case with different components, different species, um, maybe different actors, different sources of knowledge are generally more resilient than systems with few components and redundancy is providing a kind of um, insurance with that uh, system, allowing some components to compensate for loss or failure um, uh, of others. And that redundancy can be even more valuable if the components providing redundancy are reacting to differently to different changes and disturbances. So that gives us uh, what ecologists might call um, uh, response diversity. And that's a sort of, of functional redundancy. It's components that are performing the same function, providing insurance within the system, uh, allowing components to compensate for the failure uh, um, uh, of, of others. And so um, if we think of a few examples here, uh, for example, if you have one crop in a farm system uh, that's sensitive to floods and another crop that's sensitive to, to droughts, and you're growing both of those crops, your overall farm might be uh, a little bit more resilient in the case of either a flood or a drought because you've got something else to, to, um, uh, to fall back on. Um, we get that also in social systems, and this has come up in some of the other uh, talks, uh, where uh, people of different backgrounds that might be genders or cultures or whatever uh, uh, have different uh, ways of interacting. In the case of, of ecological systems, they might be using a resource differently, um, providing less stress ultimately on the resource. So uh, I talked about this example of farmers present uh, uh, planting different kinds of crops. Uh, another example might be uh, in, in parts of, of Africa, in uh, Kenya and Tanzania and the Seychelles, uh, coastal fishermen are more likely to leave fishing in response to declining catches if they have households with more diverse livelihood portfolios. So in that case, that livelihood flexibility is increasing the resilience of individual households uh, but it looks like it also reduces the pressure on different parts of the system by allowing resource users to move away from using a particular resource when it's under, under pressure. So even in, though in both of those cases, uh, the income of the farmer or the fisherman might be maximized by specializing in a single activity, by having a portfolio of options in this study, those households become more resilient and often those systems, ecosystems or landscapes um, become more, uh, more resilient um, uh, as well. Okay. So, so all together then um, diversity in biological systems helps to confer some kind of resilience uh, on the system um, where 
I'm thinking about resilience as the amount of disturbance that that system can absorb and remain uh, largely in the same uh, state or providing the same function is how we might, might measure that. And that depends in part on the ecosystem's ability to adapt and reorganize and to learn in response to, uh, to disturbance. And this is where response diversity, these different responses to a crisis or stressor are really important. So um, uh, in this case, uh, we might think of the dynamics of a system, uh, its potential states as being expressed by this uh, shape of the curve and this state at any one time being expressed by this red ball that uh, is pulled into or falls into various depressions in that, that surface. And the depth of the pit helps us to see or visualize how stable the system is in that configuration. In other words, how hard or easy it is to get the ball in and out of that uh, state. So in this case, it's quite, quite easy, quite low resilience to move this ball out of this flat grassland state quite uh, uh, hard to move out of the dust bowl state once you happen to be in it. Um, uh, and so um, that happens to be an example where we think of the resilient state as being uh, maybe a negative or bad thing in this dust bowl, but there's also examples where we might think about uh, the resilient state as being the, 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 more, uh, the more desirable. Um, and I think the important thing here is that different landscape topographies might exist at different levels of species richness. So uh, uh, the, the light line, um, oh, let me go to the next, grab this. Um, so when we have different uh, levels of species richness, we get different shapes of these curves. So this uh, light line with uh, low species richness gives us a relatively flat uh, cup there, relatively low uh, resistance. And as we increase in species richness or in other forms of diversity, what we're doing essentially is deepening that cup and providing uh, a more uh, resilient landscape for ourselves. So ultimately, uh, what that means, and this is, again, has come up in several other talks so far, is that that biodiversity is going to be uh, especially uh, important in terms of uh, in times where we're facing a lot of, of change. And so uh, ultimately, what does, uh, what does that mean? So one thing it means uh, is that we need to be thinking about diversity in the sense of redundancy. Um, I think in social ecological systems and, and governance, we often find ourselves striving for maximizing efficiency, uh, which is sometimes at odds with, with redundancy. And so maybe we need to be thinking about diversity at a variety of different levels as a more explicit focus of conservation. Then let's talk about uh, ecological diversity, which we were just talking about. And the key I think here for me as an ecologist is to think, to not forget that this isn't just about species, but is also about ecological uh, diversity at the ecosystem, at the landscape and at the genetic uh, level. And, and importantly, that we need to think about this as both a reservoir of redundancy and of a reservoir of response diversity. That then brings up the point for me of building diversity into governance, which can include uh, diversity of uh, knowledge, of practices, of ways of using and approaching uh, ecosystems. Uh, and then finally, just this focus on, on efficiency, which often undermines diversity um, because it's more efficient to streamline, right? That's the cost. Um, and so when we think about uh, that farm that I mentioned before, it's certainly more efficient for the farmer to have one type of crop, only one machine that they need to harvest, only one set of information and knowledge that they need to have about seasonality and weather patterns, et cetera. Um, that might be more efficient, but is certainly not uh, as resilient or as diverse. So let me uh, move just for a minute about why this matters at a planetary scale and how it plays out in, in different arenas other than species diversity. Um, and what I wanna focus on there is that we're 
as a planet facing uh, a lot of critical challenges here represented by uh, these planetary boundaries, which outline nine global systems for which there's reason to believe that there are important uh, global thresholds with uh, potential for significant impact on people if we cross those, um, those thresholds. And we're facing a lot of, not only a lot of challenges, but a lot of planetary change. And as has been mentioned, uh, just like this farmer responding to potential drought or floods, um, we find ourselves in a situation where as a society, we need diversity to respond to these challenges, to respond to this, uh, to this changing uh, environment. So luckily, as we look uh, around, we see people responding to these challenges with lots of different ideas about how to address these challenges, how to face the, the future. And that is um, in itself a kind of diversity, this diversity of ideas about what might help us to bring about um, uh, a better future. And you can probably think of a lot of examples yourself I was just reading in the newspaper yesterday about a group of uh, older people in poor neighborhoods in Philadelphia who walk together a few times a week. Um, it started as a way to maintain their physical health, but in doing that, they're maintaining the health of their community because they're connecting to one another. They have talked to one another about problems that they're facing in their community, maybe empty lots that they want to uh, restore and uh, uh, and do something with. So you know, people are amazingly creative at uh, at solving problems. And a group that I'm working with is is trying to collect these different ideas and learn from them. And we call them seeds or seeds of good anthropocenes. Uh, we currently have about a thousand of different uh, examples of these, and we're trying to focus in now on particular systems, mostly food systems. Um, and especially food system transformation in, uh, in some major African cities to try to understand how this diversity of ideas um, influences the resilience of systems and the way that we go about, um, about solutions. So just as with biological diversity, there's both a cost and a value of this diversity of solutions. So uh, of course, every solution has a cost and more solutions generally means more cost. Um, also solutions don't always work neatly together. They can, uh, they can collaborate, but they can also compete or conflict uh, and that has a cost. Uh, and, and of course, multiple solutions might be less efficient than focusing on just one solution that works, uh, that works uh, well. Um, uh, but there's also a value in these diversity of solutions. Um, and, you know, as we heard, I think at the very outset uh, with Simon Levin telling us, long-lived systems are adaptable. And being adaptable requires having a lot of different solutions because no one solution is going to work every time or in every place. So when we have well-coordinated solutions, they can reinforce one another. Uh, when they, uh, we maybe aren't thinking about coordination, many different solutions work like experiments from which we can uh, learn. Those solutions aren't independent, of course, they can interact in a variety of ways. If we think about that just very simply, uh, they can be reinforcing uh, one another. So cities uh, that are going green or climate neutral at the same time can share information or cooperate about ways that they're doing that. Um, but they can be contradicting, contradicting or counteracting. So uh, that might happen where uh, efforts to green grazing practices uh, can be contradicted by efforts to reduce meat eating uh, that, that influences the, the viability of those grazing operations. Um, and we can think about that in a little bit more complex way where we're not thinking about just the outcomes, but actually different pathways um, uh, of, of interaction. So um, what's going here? So here, for example, uh, we can see some solutions that simply aggregate. So uh, where we get simply 
uh, a sum of the, the outcome, global food demand as the sum of demand from all regions, quite simply. Um, but we can get other things as well, thing, uh, interactions, pathway interactions like leakage, where we have offsets from one uh, region to another, where we see uh, European bans on deforestation uh, in the face of persistent demand for wood simply increases deforestation uh, elsewhere. And we need to be thinking about that. On the more uh, positive side, we can get interactions of uh, learning where action in one place actually enables action elsewhere. So uh, in Germany, for example, we saw uh, society learn from manufacturing solar cells that reduced the cost of future solar cells everywhere and made it easier for other countries to follow uh, on this pathway to increased solar energy development. Uh, or we see examples of contagion where action spreads. So uh, the Greta Thunberg uh, school strike that exploded into a global youth movement uh, or the Arab Spring. So all of these modes of pathway uh, interaction increase the complexity of how we think about um, uh, these uh, variety of, of solutions. And so we might think about that then uh, like this, where again, uh, we have this uh, ball that's the state of our planet that is uh, traveling down some pathway, being routed into these uh, deeper or more uh, resilient, easy to get into uh, uh, depressions. But I would encourage us rather than think about that as one global system to think about that as many interacting regional systems where uh, not only is a region going down a particular pathway, but the pathway that it's going down is either constraining opportunities in other regions or providing opportunities in other regions. Uh, and that all together, uh, those pathways might add up in a variety of complex ways to some global, uh, some global outcome. Okay, so let me just pull this together here. So uh, we've seen that we're in this period of global, very, very rapid change. The solutions that we need are also changing. Having a diversity of solutions uh, results in more options, uh, more creativity and more creative solutions. Um, but there are some things that we need to do to maximize the impact of that uh, diversity. In biological systems, uh, the combination of diversity and selection does this for us. Um, but in, in when thinking about solutions to global problems, we may need uh, institutions to do this sort of coordination and anticipation and learning for ourselves. So I, I hope that as we continue on with our, our session here, that we might have some time to talk about how we can study and learn from a variety of solutions, what kinds of things what we need to think about to coordinate collection and sharing of that knowledge that we've learned uh, from studying these different solutions, how we can anticipate opportunities for collaboration and cooperation, and then how we work to maintain a diversity of solutions, including some that uh, that maybe aren't perfect or most efficient, so that we are. Uh, uh, giving ourselves that diversity of, uh, of, of solutions that we might need in times of rapid change. Okay, I'm gonna Thank stop. You. <laughs> Thank you very much, Elena. Um, and now we come to the uh, next presentation, which is um, Professor Steve Polosky, who is Professor of Ecological and Environmental, and Environmental Economics at University of Minnesota. And, and Steve is gonna talk about the economic value of biodiversity Bridging the fields of ecology and economics. So over to you, Steve. Great, thank you, Francis, um, and and thank you to the organizers of, of this session. I've, I've found it extremely stimulating, um, really interesting ideas that um, get applied in different fields, and you know, see the vast array of applications that these ideas have. So I, I'm going to talk about kind of bridging between uh, the worlds of, of of economics and ecology. Um, this picture here, this actually came from uh, um, uh, the, uh, the front of the, uh, the cover of The Economist magazine in 2005, shortly after uh, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment uh, released, its, uh, released its report. Um, 
And I, I think the idea here is that, you know, the economy is actually embedded in nature. You know, the economy happens on earth. We need to care about earth systems and the linkages between the economy and earth systems. Um, and, uh, you know, one way of thinking about this is that uh, these earth systems, these biodiversity are incredibly important forms of, of natural capital. Um, and one of the things that motivates me, so, you know, question why try to value uh, biodiversity? Well, we realized that, uh, and, and Elena uh, kind of showed this in, in her slides, that economic activity is causing a rapid decline in biodiversity or otherwise stated as natural capital, that loss of biodiversity threatens human well-being. And if we're going to uh, reverse this or address this, you know, one, uh, one necessary condition is actually to make visible what currently is often invisible in government and, and, and business circles. So, you know, showing what the, uh, the importance or the value um, of this biodiversity actually is. Um, I'll just say there have been a number of very high profile reports. So starting at the upper left with the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment in 2005, um, I just collected a, a, a number of these. Um, many of these are quite recent. So the, the, the bottom four, uh, excuse me, the, the four on the bottom row to the right are all from 2021 uh, or later. And these you know, from the UN, uh, from the World Bank, from the UK government, which commissioned Partha Desgupta to talk about the economics of biodiversity. From the World Economic Forum, so so this is you know the, the, this is getting you know this is our time to talk about natural capital and the value of, of biodiversity. Um, so in thinking about uh, you know how an economist might approach this question of the value of biodiversity, there, there's really been two strands of literature. They're related, but they're they're somewhat different. And so I want to talk about each in turn. The first really takes the notion of diversity seriously, much in the way that we've talked about it uh, here. So, you know, let's think about a measure either of species diversity or genetic diversity uh, or ecosystem diversity in the way that Elena talked about it, um, and show that a change in this kind of measure of diversity is linked to some uh, economic value. The second, which um, I have to say is the dominant strain of literature now puts biodiversity kind of in the background. Uh, so some people they'll say the value of biodiversity and really what they mean is sort of the value of nature or natural capital. So kind of biodiversity is synonymous with nature and show how nature uh, contributes to human well-being. This is called nature's contribution to people or ecosystem services. So, let me talk about that first notion, that value of diversity. And I'm, I'm, I'm skimming over a, a large set of literature, but I'll, I'll give you two examples. One from the genetic level or genetic diversity and, and the notion of kind of bioprospecting, or we think that there's our interesting uh, genetic information out there that might lead to, let's say, pharmaceuticals or other things. Um, and then a, a, a second, thinking about how species diversity contributes to ecological functions that then provide these valuable um, ecosystem services. So on the first one, you know, we might think that there are interesting uh, genetic com or biological compounds um, in different species, um, you know, clearly uh, interest in, in, in drug companies looking for um, interesting uh, biological material. The greater the number of species that you have, uh, the greater chance that at least one of these species contains uh, this biological compound. So it's kind of like, you know, the more trials or the more chances that you get or options that you have. Um, but there is kind of a, a paradox here. Uh, so in the 1990s, people were quite excited about this as potentially providing a, a reason for thinking that this would, this would provide uh, value for uh, conserving species. But uh, this paper uh, by David Simpson and, and co-authors um, showing that, you know, the value of species conservation is actually low when there's a lot of species, you know, the, the chance that one species has something that n minus one species don't becomes quite small as, as n grows large. But that treats all species as having equal probability of success, but there are differences uh, among species and, and uh, some species are quite unique. So if we really thought about the diversity of those species, the genetic diversity of those species, 
then some species without close relatives, we would think are sort of more unique and hence more valuable. There's a chance that they have some compound that other species do not. Um, so if we thought about uh, applying this then, it's not just the number of species, but the diversity of the species where we care about uh, how dissimilar uh, various species are from, from one another. And so in work that I did with uh, Andy Solo, um, uh, we, we looked at, at, at this notion and thought about, you know, what's the probability that a set of species uh, contains a certain characteristic? So this is a kind of a probabilistic model. Um, you, you, you need to put on a lot of structure if you really want the probabilities, but you can also uh, look at this and get sort of a lower bound on this probability with a very general uh, parametric model. And that's what I'll talk about here. So there's a a lower bound called Gallo's inequality, but basically, and I'm sorry for the math here, I, I didn't really have time to clean up the slide, but basically what this means is that if, if you take the pairwise dissimilarities between any two species and you form a matrix out of this, and you could think about um, the, the inverse of that matrix, basically what it does is it captures the, um, what I'll call the effective number of species. The, so if I have a lot of species, but they're very, very similar, that's effectively like having one species. But if I have uh, those same set of species and they're quite dissimilar, then, then effectively I have n species. And so that's what, this, that's what this gets at. And I'll just give you a quick example. So this is on the lower left is a, is a group of species um, and um, sort of the represented in, in, in two-dimensional space, kind of the, the genetic distance between these species. And the, the idea here is, you know, we could, we could have a measure of, like what's the chance that all of these, or you know, what's the value of having all of these species, all 26 of these, versus what's the, the, the value of having just three, which are at the very extremes of this. So kind of at the, if you, if you look at this as a triangle, like if you just had three species that are at the kind of outer vertex of this triangle uh, versus you had like eight species, but they're all clumped up at the top of this diagram. And so, uh, what the measure here is, 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 is shows that you can get, um, if, if, for example, the dissimilarity matters a lot, then just having, for example, three species, if you look at that middle column there, having three species captures a lot of what is present in this whole 26 uh, species. Okay. Shifting slightly, um, thinking about not at the genetic level, but how species diversity leads to uh, increased in ecological function, which may be uh, related therefore to um, ecosystem services that, that we care about. Um, so this is work uh, with, with my colleague, uh, Dave Tillman, uh, who's done a lot of work linking uh, diversity, species diversity and ecological function. So the left of this diagram shows what happens in a homogeneous environment. And so each of these dots is actually a draw. And, and you'll see that, and this is, this is just a, a simulation, but in a homogeneous environment, the best species, the, the species which is best matched to the environmental conditions does, as, you know, does perfectly well. So you don't have a lot of necessarily value of diversity if you pick well. Uh, but on the right, you have a variable or heterogeneous environment. And there, no individual species will do as well across the range of conditions. And so this is something you know, Scott Page and, and Simon started with, which is the world is uncertain. There are a variety of conditions. And diversity is extremely important uh, to cover those range of, of conditions. Well, well, that's theory, but, but uh, Dave Tillman has done a lot of work uh, actually showing this uh, empirically. Uh, so Cedar Creek uh, 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 Biological Station just outside the Twin Cities in Minnesota. Um, and he has shown that on the bottom here is the, the number of species in a plot and on the vertical axis is the, how, how much, in this case, above ground biomass. And you can see that in different years here, but, but the general trend is that you get uh, that, that more diverse systems outperform less diverse systems. And the, there are a variety of different ways that he's uh, shown this and, and tested this. So this is total biomass. The, the previous one was above ground biomass. Okay, I wanna shift gears. So, so that's, you know, again, linking particular 
uh, measures of diversity, species diversity or genetic diversity to a particular kind of value to uh, people or economic value. Um, more recently, there's been an explosion of literature on the sort of value of nature. And again, biodiversity is there, but it's not uh, front and center. Um, and this is, uh, so people call this ecosystem services or nature's contributions to people. There recently was uh, uh, important uh, global assessment by IPBES, which stands for the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. Um, one of the things that came out of that assessment uh, is if we look over the past 50 years, what have been the trends in important globally, uh, in important ecosystem services. So each row here, apologize it's small, I don't, I'm not going to talk about each row individually, but each row is a different type of, of uh, contribution. So we have regulating uh, 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 services and material and non-material services. And the orange indicates that the trend has been downward over the past 50 years globally. Uh, the blue is an, is, is an increase. Actually, one of the interesting things uh, from an economic point of view is that th those things which are, do show up in markets that have market value, primarily material uh, goods and services, are the ones that tend to do better, have shown less decline. And in fact, uh, many of those have increased over the last 50 years. But if you don't pay for them, the regulatory and non-material, those have generally declined. Um, so a, a number of us have worked at actually quantifying, uh, so modeling and quantifying uh, these. So in the Natural Capital Project, we've, we've worked to uh, have a model called Integrated Valuation of Ecosystem Services and Trade-offs. I'll just give you one um, application or example of this. And this is actually, uh, since I knew I was gonna be talking uh, here to a number of Chinese colleagues, I, I, I wanted to show an example that was led by colleagues at the Chinese Academy of Sciences, uh, in particularly the leadership of, of uh, Professor Uyang um, on what we call, uh, what he really has, has pioneered called gross ecosystem product. Um, okay, so we all know about GDP or gross domestic product, the kind of standard measure uh, that economists use of how an economy is performing, which measures the, the flow of goods and services in an economy over a certain time period, usually annually. But these are, these are marketed goods and services. Um, what if we instead looked at what is nature contributing? Now, what, what are the value of these ecosystem services, ecosystem goods and services? Now, some of these, are marketed, so agricultural output or forestry, et cetera, fisheries. So some of that is already captured in GDP, but there are many of these values um, of ecosystem services or nature's contributions that are not valued in the market. And so they don't show up in GDP, but they clearly contribute to human well being. So there's overlap between these two measures, but there are many parts of nature's contributions which are frankly invisible in standard economic accounting. So we set out to uh, do this in, uh, in China. So you need to, first of all, think about you know, the, the status conditions of the natural capital. How does that translate into flows of ecosystem goods and services? What is the value of those goods and services? So what's the price of them? And then aggregate these up into a measure, an aggregate measure of GDP, being careful not to uh, double count. So this builds on earlier work, um, again, led by colleagues at the Chinese Academy of Sciences on, on quantifying the flows of ecosystem services. Um, then we apply this, uh, in this particular case in, in Qinghai province in, in Western China. Uh, just to prove I'm an economist, I can, I can show a, a, a chart with numbers that is in, impenetrable, but basically the idea here is that each row is, a, is an ecosystem services and we've, we've valued them both in physical terms and in value terms, economic value terms in 2000 and in 2015 and looked and see how they, how they change. Now, China is actually uh, planning to implement this across China. Um, so not just in Qinghai, but um, at the provincial level, um, city and county level, and then all across all of China. This is an example showing you, we, we can demonstrate where the supply of ecosystem services originates and where the beneficiaries um, of those ecosystem services lie. So just to wrap up, um, you know, thinking about the, the road ahead, 
there are many reasons why biodiversity contributes uh, to people. So instead of calling these nature's contributions to people, here I'll re refer to BCP or biodiversity's contributions to people. Many of these are invisible. Um, there is a rapid loss of biodiversity. And so my feeling is that there's an urgent need to actually make visible this. So having better metrics of value and better incorporating these um, into decision-making. So thanks very much. Thank you, Steve. That, that was great. Um, so now we'll move to our final presentation, which is a discussion on the part of um, Joshua Plotkin, who's professor in evolutionary biology and ecology at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, hopefully we'll still have a bit of time for discussion. So uh, um, at, at the end of that, go ahead, Joshua, over to you. Thanks especially to Long Chen and the Luan Academy for arranging this diverse set of simulating speakers. Um, I'd like to offer some comments um, and I'll try to keep them brief so we have time for joint discussion. Um, in response to Elena and Stephen, but also actually in response to intersections with um, ideas that Scott and Andy presented earlier this morning or this evening. Um, I wanna talk about the role of diversity in teams and respond to some ideas that we've heard about that and also the role of cultural diversity. Um, so we heard from Scott about this really interesting idea about diversity in teams in terms of diversity in um, cognitive styles and how that impacts the outcome of the team and um, diversity in cultural um, backgrounds within a team. And this actually is brought to mind, in fact, I assembled these slides whilst um, Scott and everyone else was speaking, some of my own interests in research about diversity in teams. It's different from diversity um, that is standing diversity, but it has to do with diversity achieved through dynamic pairings within a team. So there's another kind of diversity that can occur within a team when individuals are forced to shift around who they play with. And so this is a very recent um, research where we've studied how a bunch of individuals who are actually identical in their uh, objectives, they're all kind of selfish individuals trying to, trying to optimize their own payoff, um, behave in a population when they're forced to sort of switch partners at a certain um, rate. And so the basic idea is that individuals are playing a complicated game. It's actually an iterated prisoner's dilemma where it's hard to achieve a good outcome, but once in a while they have to play the game with someone new. And that mere fact of switching up who you're interacting with in your team um, produces diversities of um, strategies over time that would not exist if the team were consisting of single stable pairs. And, as, and the result of this for collective outcomes can be profound. Um, if individuals play only against a single opponent over time and they're selfish, then we have this tragedy of commons and people end up over time having very poor payoffs and complicated tasks like the iterated prisoner's dilemma. But if they're forced to switch partners over time, um, then the population as a whole can achieve a good outcome. And this is a kind of diversity that's achieved not through individual differences, but just through ephemeral interactions with different individuals within a team. And I think this is sort of interesting and maybe related to things that Scott mentioned. Um, one of the interesting points here is that it's a good collective outcome. So there's a huge literature on multiple agents and trying to learn how to do a problem. Some of that literature just wants to find one agent who can you know, solve a problem really well. Here, however, the goal is for the whole population to sort of collectively solve the problem well. And this is relevant for some tasks like self-driving cars where the goal isn't to get just one car that's good at avoiding collisions. You have to have all the cars um, good at their task. So there's a kind of diversity that can be achieved dynamically, even if all the individuals have the same kind of in inherent programming. So that's the one thing I wanted to say in response to um, some comments from Scott. Um, but I also have comments um, in response to some, in, some uh, ideas from Elena and Stephen um, on the role and maintenance and production of diversity in ecological and biological systems and how that might be reflected um, and how ideas from those theories can be um, used to study the, what promotes diversity in social and cultural systems. Um, and I'll try to bring this up by talking about a topic that might seem a little bit weird to begin with. I wanna talk about a cultural trait um, that is super diverse, which is just our first names, um, at least in the United States and uh, many Western countries, there's an enormous diversity of first names. I um, mean, there's lots of things that go into 
producing diversity of first names. There's boom bust cycles, which also happen, by the way, in biology. Um, there's perennial favorites and so on. And what I've worked on over the last few years and finally finished um, is a way of trying to understand what, what kind of role of selection, which we heard a little bit from Andy Lowe, um, might play in promoting um, the dynamics and diversity of cultural traits like first names. And um, we've looked at, in some sense, all of the first names in the United States over a long period of time, and as well as other countries. And the key thing that we've looked at, um, and this draws a little bit on what Elena was talking about, is one of the classic ideas from ecology, which has to do with frequency dependent selection, that the benefit of one type may depend upon its current frequency in the population. And in particular, if rare types are more beneficial um, or have a higher fitness, then that can stimulate diversity. Um, and so we've worked hard to learn how to infer, infer the form of frequency dependent selection that's operating from, in any given cultural system from time series data. And indeed we infer that there is this very strong negative frequency dependence operating on baby names. Um, in a whole range of different countries, so that the rare, the rarest names, for the most part, are really the most fit. You want these kind of, you want as a parent, you want to give your endow your child with a cool, rare name. The really common names are boring and have negative growth rates. Um, and this is this basic, this really simple idea borrowed from ecology, but now quantified from time series data, is to a large extent what explains the diversity of names in all these different countries. In fact, the actual shape of the abundance distribution of names can be explained by the form of frequency dependent selection. This weird shape of the abundance distribution that has a kind of, um, it has a kind of, uh, it has a kind of elbow here at a certain frequency is explained by what frequencies are preferred by selection and what more common frequencies are disfavored by selection. Um, so this is a way of thinking about what are the selective forces, even complex selective forces that pattern the, the structure of standing diversity in a cultural trait. Um, so there are also maybe sort of subtleties that, that um, occur in, um, in culture um, where different subsets, di different subsets of the population experience different types of selection that produce different patterns of diversity. And so one example, again, here in names has to do with biblical names. As you guys might guess, Biblical names, you might think have an advantage, the, the Johns and the Davids and so on. And indeed we do find that um, separating biblical and non-biblical names, there's a very, biblical names have about a two and a half percent fitness advantage almost at all frequency classes compared to non-biblical names. So that different portions of the populations, different subsets can experience different types of diversity producing um, selection. And nonetheless, the biblical names show the same overall pattern that the rarer the biblical name, the more cool, the better, the more desirable it is. And the really common biblical names, the less desirable they are. And so we can think about these biblical and non-biblical names perhaps as different sectors of the population. And I'll comment that on that at the very end. The last thing I wanted to say has to do with um, boom bust cycles, where again, we've looked at another cultural trait, which is pet dog breeds, which have been collected by um, collectors and are known to undergo fashion cycles. So um, Longchen also mentioned the importance of fashion cycles, which can produce boom bust patterns. And you might think would sort of boom bust patterns might kind of drive out diversity. And what we have found, however, is that even though there's strong boom bust patterns, the overall effect of those boom bust patterns is to have negative frequency dependent selection that actually supports diversity. And so, um, although I can't go into all the details right now, um, that basic idea is that even in cultural traits that show strong boom bust patterns, there is sort of an effective frequency dependence that ma maintains diversity of traits over time. Um, and that can be understood through frequency dependent selection. Now, the thing I wanna close with is the idea of trying to infer the forms of um, selection that are operating, not just on baby names and, and, and dogs, which are just sort of toy cases, but are operating on things like firm size and um, lots of the sort of more economically important topics that people have mentioned before. This is, I think, open or terra incognita. Like we have a lot of time series data on firms. In fact, um, we've discussed with Martin a collaboration. Now I think we're finally ready to pursue it. And hopefully we can take some of these ideas from evolution and ecological theory to understand and infer how frequency effects um, drive the diversity and also the dynamics and turnover 
of um, other, other cultural organizations, not just your first name, but the size and um, lifetime and life history of, of companies. So that's all I have to say. And I would hope I'm, hopefully I'm leaving enough time open for general discussion. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, uh, Joshua, that's terrific. Um, so we will now go to, we haven't got very long, we have about 10 minutes, um, but we can like to go to see if there are any questions. Um, and so uh, I, will, I will address people who've raised their hands. So uh, right now I have Simon and Martin Reeves. So Simon, do you wanna go first? Sure, thank you. And uh, thanks Francis for a great job moderating and all, <clears throat> all the speakers. I just have some quick thoughts from listening to the talks. First of all, uh, there was a reference from Brian Arthur arguing that uh, um, that combinatorial um, processes were different than natural selection, but they're not. Um, I'm, I, <clears throat> Brian's contributions are great to this, but uh, in fact, recombination is a very important part of the way natural selection works, just reinforcing the fact of what we can learn um, from uh, natural selection. Secondly, uh, in terms of, I guess, Scott's discussion of the adjacent possible, uh, Josh, it reminded me of the work on neutral networks and the, the things that you did on volatility. Uh, the, the, um, and and uh, maybe uh, you'll have some uh, comment uh, on that. Uh, I, one thing that came up over and over again, and I really think we should pursue, is the notion that there's an optimal level of uh, diversity. It's the same as what the optimal mutation rate would be. Uh, you don't want to explore too much, uh, but you, uh, but <clears throat> because there's this trade-off. And so as a research question, I think that uh, um, uh, is important. Uh, the fourth point is that uh, Elena uh, talked about uh, essentially response diversity. Uh, I put on the slide, but didn't talk about it very much this notion of degeneracy that comes from Gerald Edelman, which is the notion <clears throat> that uh, diversity can be having a lot of different uh, kinds of functions, but it could also be a lot of different elements that perform the same function. So if you lose one, you get others. So th this is a con concept that comes up uh, over and over again. Um, and finally, uh, Scott's notion of uh, uh, the importance of diversity for collective intelligence, uh, I think has been evident in, in what we've brought here today with people coming from such diverse backgrounds. Elena made that point. So that's all I wanted to say. Thanks to all. Thank you, Simon. Um, Martin. Uh, yeah, I, rather than a question, because we may not have time for the q and I mean, the, uh, the sort of implied interesting questions are across all the very interesting presentations we heard today. For me, one would be uh, this idea of um, the optimal level of, of diversity, because in, in business, you know, a synonym for diversity is complexity. So there must be some sort of optimum. Um, but we don't have no idea about how to to, to calculate that. Um, you know, I think a second interesting question is, um, you know, diversity of, 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 of diversity, you know, sh shift in patterns of diversity. What sort of diversity do we need, do we need when? And we've got some research that shows that, um, uh, that the benefits of diversity can be achieved uh, through different patterns of diversity in different parameters. So, you know, the significance of diversity of, div of, of, of diversity. And um, a third one is, um, you know, I've, I had two strands on diversity today, and I'm sort of curious about how they relate. One of them is, you might call it diversity of composition, diversity of the elements. But then we heard about dynamic diversity, which is, you know, even in the absence of diversity of composition, uh, mechanism design for uh, creating uh, diversity, even in a homogeneous population. So how do those two things interact in, uh, in systems design in something like business? But uh, thank you, Seb, everybody, a really interesting discussion. Thank you, Martin. Would anybody else like to uh, add something to this? Uh conversation or to ask a question? There are some in the uh, chat. Uh, Sorry, I don't see anything in the chat. Okay. Uh, the one from Jeff Parker who might want yeah. to. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, are you on? Could you, do you want yeah, to just yeah, ask a question? Okay. I'll, I'll just elaborate. I mean, I think, you know, I love this notion that diversity offers you a lot more options to choose from, but then it suggests that the next layer is what the filter and selection process is. And you can have an awful lot of bias um, in that process, even if you have a good set of options from which to choose. So I would think that some thought about the mechanism design um, around that. And I think 
Sky, you alluded to this and talked about, quote, I think radical honesty and transparency, which to me I interpreted as, you know, no matter who the speaker is, you're actually going to listen to them and be honest about it. Uh, but maybe you could say a bit more and, you know, Andrew and others, I think, are all um, kind of hitting on this issue of how do you actually do selection? What arises to the top once you've generated these good options? Scott, do you want to respond to this? Is yeah, except it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's just a great question. I mean, one of the things that we see a lot in diversity research, and we, the editors of this new journal, Collective Intelligence, um, talked about for about an hour last week was this kind of inverted view of diversity that like, as you have more ideas and more ways of seeing things, it gets harder to sort of make sense of them all, think about which ones you could you should recombine. And Martin has some fabulous work on this. And that like, when you think about diversity, it's you can think about how well each one does on, on its own, but also how its capacity to, to sort of be recombined with other things. And it's not that there's some sort of, you know, diversity catastrophe, you reach some point where it falls off, but it's, it's going to more is better, more is better, but then somehow managing all the ideas and the people and the different ways of seeing just gets harder. And so even like, you know, Galore's new book on like sort of economic growth over time, he gets the same thing. You know, he shows that if, you know, some countries are more diverse, they'd be way better off. And if other countries had just more cohesion, they'd be way better off. So it's just this, it's this constant balance that it's just harder to manage as you get more. Okay. We also have another question to that type from Wei Lui. Uh, um, exactly what I would like to know more about what Scott mentioned, what, what you meant by management matters. Um, you know, I think that everybody's circling around this issue, which I think is a very important one about, you know, what is, what's the ingredient of managing these, these complex teams or organizations that differentiates between one, one fails and one succeeds. You got anything more to say about yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, I wish I, I wish I had an answer to the you know good answers. I think you know one of the things I'd like to point out, like so, Elena in this sort of the seeds of the Anthropocene is trying to create a culture in which people sharing their ways of thinking is encouraged. So that's the one dimension that really seems to matter. You need the ideas out there. At the same time, you know, Martin and I have spent a number of conversations in other contexts about then how do you construct and build good ways to evaluate all those different ideas, right? So it, again, it's, it goes back to Fisher's fundamental theorem in a way. Good management requires, in some sense, creating a culture, a mindset, an environment, technologies, methods to generate lots of variation and combine it in interesting ways. And then also the rigor, um, the discipline, and the honesty <laughs> to select bad ideas. Um, you know, I think about like a good marriage is the same way, right? Like we have ideas that our spouse says not a very good idea, but it takes a long time to build up that honesty, I think. And what, what about, uh, just putting my aura in here, what about basic kind of facilitating techniques? So what we call you know, like soft skills and management it would seem to me that we have evidence that there have been real successes and failures on even on, on major negotiations like climate negotiation, depending on who is facilitating and managing it. And I think it's a kind of in, a kind of invisible hand <laughs> there, but <clears throat> which isn't recognized uh, too often. But I think um, you probably have come across that in your work as well. I would think. Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's I think there's a lot of people in this space that have thought really hard about how do you, you know um, you know exactly that set of questions. And, and one of the things we saw, I thought uh, Chen Long's piece on you know digitization. Once AI also becomes someone in the room, I think managing AI in this space uh, gets even trickier. Yeah, and that's involved as well. Martin, did you want to say something? Or that was just a random hand up, hand uh, down. Well, um, you, you know, I think uh, just the tip of the iceberg there is, you know, as Scott is associated with an, an interesting software company that is, uh, if you like, the a better software equivalent of great facilitation. So how do you, how do you create these frequency dependent selection mechanisms in an organization? What are the either the organizational algorithmics, the organizational mechanisms, or the technological tools that facilitate that. I think that's that's another interesting frontier in the application of some of the ideas we've heard about today uh, in uh, in organizations. Thank you. Excuse me. Would, did you, would you have something to say? Do you want to add? Yes. To my, yeah, i like to <clears throat> quickly respond to uh, just Simon's comments. So thanks for correcting uh, my understanding of Frank Arthur's work. Uh, but I think there's uh, 
from my understanding of his, his book of his and his ideas, basically what he's saying is that it's different from the this combination of the of the inputs is different from the Darwin period because it's just much faster. So his point is that technology evolves much faster than traditional ways. I I think I get your point that the the logic is the same, uh, but the I think the that combination intentional evolution could make a interesting oh. role. And I think that pertains to today's topic that we need to think about, we can design diversity in some way. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, I think that's the, 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 the speed. And, and Josh has a comment in the chat on this too. It, um, I think it's a fascinating uh, question, but it's certainly the case uh, not only with normal uh, genetic recombination, but um, uh, the, the speed of evolution. You, you, you know, um, um, Herbert Simon talked about this and, and with, with his watchmakers, and the same is true in evolution. There, there are papers on this where, um, where, um, where um, functions that that were derived. Uh, for particular purposes, become recombined, uh, maybe even in um, in the evolution of multicellularity, so that the that the speed of evolution, um, in, it depends a lot on the recombination of uh, um, of um, elements. Uh, um, Josh has a comment in the uh, uh, in the chat, so maybe he wants to respond to that too. Yeah, sure. I I I, I really think that, I mean, it really comes from my own recent. Um, investigations with uh, some colleagues that this question of reassortment within a team over a certain time scale is really both difficult and important. Um, their diversity is produced not through the idea that different team members have different cognitive styles, which is a separate and, and re other form of diversity, but diversity is produced by the fact that certain combinations of individuals produce different um, behaviors and other combinations. And it's beneficial to reassort individuals over a certain period, over at a certain time scale. And we've seen in very simple models that over, we've just demonstrated that reassortment over, reassortment is, some reassortment is often radically better than none, but we have no idea what the optimal level of reassortment is in a learning task, but it's in, eminently studyable, um, at least in formal models. I don't, uh, connecting it to actual performance of teams, I, would be a really interesting question. Is there empirical data on how often teams have been kind of shuffled around and how often does management um, kind of perturb a, perturb a team? Um, even if it seems to be doing pretty well right now, um, how often does management nonetheless force perturbations in team membership? Um, I think those are really important questions when the, out, when the objective is for some sort of collective outcome as opposed to just one sub, sub portion of the population doing really well. So I just open, I think those are just open areas of research in my mind. Well, you? thank you. Uh, hi, uh, I actually want to uh, remind people that Joanne posed a very interesting question there on world view uh, diversity, which I happen to have this question, uh, which is related because uh, Elena mentioned this really interesting uh, success of 1000 different you know, experiments in my, in my view, and which relates to what Scott was mentioning. But in my view, uh, many of these uh, you know, kind of experiments are small scale, just like there was some, dis you know, there, there, were, there was some dis debates in the, uh, of the uh, uh, Elena Ostrom's uh, lineage, her, her students about whether her principles apply only to small systems. But when we are entering to big systems, we're still uh, subject to tragic commons. And so my question is uh, whether there exists um, well, any, any you know, mechanism that, that could help us trickle up uh, the successes of uh, applying, by, uh, applying diversity at smaller scales, smaller sc uh, groups uh, to these bigger problems, which is actually related to Joanne's right. question on worldview diversity, which is definitely a macro scale diversity. Yeah, and I just would add from Joanne, maybe you want to kick in. I think there's another point you have here about value diversity, about whether or not that's that's something that is of real value as we move forward or not. Do you want to weigh in on that, Joanne? Thank you. Um, I, I think you know we've we've really touched a lot on it when we've heard about team diversity and the different kind of cognitive styles in teams. We've done a lot of work. Um, in the past trying in kind of stakeholder processes 
to bring in the different really value communities, which is kind of in the Mary Douglas tradition, we're calling more worldview communities. And the more I see the polarization that's going on in the, with the anti-vax, uh, with the you know, climate deniers, not just in the US, but across Europe, the more I'm seeing that you know we're tending to say, hey, we've got the worldview that's right and we're excluding the others. Um, and and you know what you know what the Mary Douglas you know kind of theory tells us that as soon as we do that, the others will sabotage whatever policies we come up with, and so we're not going to reach any kind of robust policies. And certainly, we're seeing that, aren't we? <laughs> um, and unless we start really taking seriously the fact that we've got other lenses and we've got other worldviews that are viewing these problems perhaps differently than. Uh, the kind of scientific uh, community lens. Okay, thank you, Joanne. I'm um, just in the interest of time, we're almost five minutes over and I know people are having to drop out. I, I didn't want to, uh, I think we should bring it to a close. It's been a very, very stimulating conversation. I myself found it uh, all kinds of bells and whistles and stars going off here. So I, I think it's been very rich. I want to thank Simon and Regina for organizing it and for the speakers for putting together what were very, very sophisticated and stimulating discussions. And I, I think it, like any really good panel like this, it just you know provokes, I think, um, a whole new range of questions uh, around you know, what should be the next piece that we could or should research in this space. So um, with that, uh, again, I'd like to thank the organizers and uh, all of the presenters and, uh, and all the people who've attended. I think it's been a, a great two and a half hours. So thank you very much. And hopefully we'll see you in other contexts. Thank you, Francis. And thanks to all. Thank you, all. Thank you Francis. Thank you, Francis. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye for now. Yeah. Bye. Bye.